It wouldn't be the first time I forgot that. Good evening. Due to the coronavirus pandemic and pursuant to Governor Sununa's emergency order number 12 issued on March 23rd, 2020, and in accordance with Executive Order 2020-04, the Planning Board Capital Improvement Program Subcommittee is authorized to meet electronically without a quorum, physically present in the same location. Please note there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with Emergency Order 12, we've taken action to provide public access to the meeting by telephone with potential additional access by video, provide public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, and provide a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. Uh, for this meeting, Microsoft Teams is being used as the communication platform all members of the CIP subcommittee have the ability to communicate contemporaneously and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary participate in the meeting by visiting lebanonnh.gov slash live and clicking on the pertinent listed meeting. Instructions on how to attend are provided on the web page. To assist in the preparation of the meeting minutes and to ensure all participants are aware of who is speaking, all speakers are asked to identify themselves before beginning to speak. In order to ensure the best possible transmission of the meeting content, it is suggested that you disable the camera on your chosen device to reduce the video feed and increase the available bandwidth for all attendees. To improve sound quality and reduce the amount of feedback in the system, please ensure your microphones are muted unless you are making uh, a comment or asking a question. If you're attending by telephone, please press star six to mute or unmute yourself. If anyone has a problem with access during the course of the meeting, please email planning at lebanonnh.gov. Staff will do its best to resolve the issue. In the event there are technical difficulties and we are unable to hold the meeting, we will be adjourned and rescheduled. All votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. The meeting will begin by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their name, please state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under RSA 91A. Uh, Mr. Garber. So I am present at the uh, City Hall. Ms. Davis. Present and alone. And Mr. Martz. Tom Martz is present and alone. Okay. Thank you. With that introduction to the meeting, um, <clears throat> I do want to briefly, without going into all the detail that we went into last time at the start of the meeting, uh, just quickly remind uh, the folks at Public Works who are on tonight's call that Lebanon defines CIP items to include capital expenditures that pertain to planning and land use within the city, including the acquisition of land, construction of new buildings and facilities over $50,000, major planning related studies over $25,000, and those projects that could have an impact on the city's capacity for growth. Other capital expenditures, including operational items and maintenance improvements that do not increase the capacity for growth, uh, are excluded from the definition of a CIP item. Planning Board only reviews CIP items and does, as defined above, and does not review or comment to the City Council on other capital expenditures. Uh, like last year, the subcommittee will again be scoring projects based on criteria developed by the Planning Board and the Planning Department. Staff recommends that the subcommittee take a few moments at the end of each project discussion to create a composite score for that project. These composite scores will be compiled by staff and made available to the full planning board, the administration, and the city council as a means to further evaluate and prioritize the proposed projects as the review process continues forward. Uh, so Jim, the way we did this and, and everyone else, uh, last week, we went through library, airport, fire, police, and recreation and started in on planning. Um, each, uh, each department head in that case, or division head for tonight's purposes, uh, described the projects. Board members asked questions if they had any, and then we went through the uh, review criteria and generated a score, and we got pretty comfortable going through that. So I will, uh, hopefully we can proceed rather expeditiously tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Jim Donison to 
introduce the first project, which is Valley Cemetery, the maintenance building replacement. And I will put that packet information on the screen. Yeah, David, just before, can you clarify how these are going to be grouped so we know where we're heading with our first criteria? Yes, thank you. So um, one of the scoring criteria is the department or division's priority. So in each case, uh, I've grouped the projects tonight. The two cemetery projects are first. A uh, group of road and intersection and bridge projects are next, then some of the facilities, city hall and, and facilities assessment, then the water, then the sewer, then the landfill. In each case, uh, I would ask, or, or the committee will ask, which project, if you have multiple projects, which one is the highest priority? Uh, that project will receive a score of three. Uh, Something other than that will be a two or a one, and we'll talk about that. Some of the projects, landfill uh, appears to have the most projects, uh, so I'll get I'll ask Mark to, to start thinking about that before we get to him. Um, but I'll ask uh, Pat McCarthy to, to be ready to describe between the two cemetery projects, for example, which one is the higher priority. And I'm going to share my screen to have the packet information up for you. Find it. All right, so while you're finding it, I'll, I'll do a uh, brief introduction. We have with us tonight uh, Patrick McCarthy, who was, who was a cemetery sexton, and he will speak to uh, two of the cemetery projects. We have Christina Hall, the city engineer, and she's going to speak to uh, a couple of the infrastructure roadway bridge projects. We have Brian Vincent, and he as well will speak to uh, a couple of the roadway bridge infrastructure projects. We have uh, Eric Brittner, and she will speak to a uh, sewer rehabilitation project. We have, uh, let's see, Jay Sorelli. He's going to speak to the, uh, the water project, which is the source water as well as the uh, the water main extension as well as the two wastewater projects and Everett Hammond will be available for questions although he has to leave for the class six roads meeting which is scheduled tonight at 6 30 and let's see did we Mark Morgan he will follow up at the end he will be our closer and he will speak about the uh, uh, the multitude of uh, solid waste projects. And I'll speak to a couple if no one's available to speak to them. So with that, uh, do you want us to, looks like we have the Valley Cemetery Building Project to uh, lead, the, uh, lead the CIP projects. Patrick. Good evening. Um, so when we wrote up the project request, we tried to kind of follow your um, criteria evaluation and try and address every subject that you had in it to limit um, the confusion or questions that you may have. Um, an overview of it is um, this is a building that we operate out of daily, um, spring, summer, fall, winter months, we go down to partial staff um, as there isn't as much maintenance in the cemeteries, but those guys go over and assist on the highway end. Um, this building's in pretty extremely poor condition. Um, it's still rotted all the way around it. The rear wall has come detached. Um, it's really undersized for what we're doing. It also seconds as our city tomb. Um, the tomb is underneath which we store uh, human re remains for surrounding towns. So there is a little bit of revenue that comes out of this building. Um, we've seen more this year in it because of the COVID situation. Um, but I don't, I don't project that that's going to continue. Um, it's just that people haven't been opening up cemeteries in our surrounding areas that utilize this space. Um, we are proposing that the building be slightly larger um, to accommodate the equipment that we have now, as well as make timing for us with equipment going back and forth to West Lebanon, where we're typically storing it. It would then be stored um, in this building, as well as the opportunity to um, create the salt brine system and the mixture in our winter months to um, help lower the cost of maintenance on our roadways. Um, it's a pretty inefficient building. There's not a whole lot of insulation to it, so it kind of meets the criteria of the city's master plan becoming energy efficient. 
um, and it's got the opportunity to expand on the solar project um, the way the building currently faces would be the optimal position um, to add solar panels as well. Um, cost for the project, uh, we estimated, we got some quotes from contractors, um, both stick built and um, prefab steel reinforced. Um, total projects about 325,000. We did add at the end some uh, roadway paving um, that would likely need to be done as well, um, bringing the total project cost to 405,000. And I do want to note that currently, or previously, and still currently, um, when we were doing the sale of lots, all of the income from it, 50% is going to the general fund, the other 50% um, was going to a perpetual care fund, which we could only touch the interest of. And just last night, we proposed to um, council as well that we change that and create a special reserve fund to help um, fund projects like this or other expansions or expansions of cemeteries. Um, for space in the future as well to try and offset and maybe not have to use um, a CIP to to fund these projects. Okay, committee members, questions? Uh, uh, this is Tom. Can you hear me, Dave? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's it's kind of a question, but it's also a comment, and that is uh, the Recreation Department is also requesting a building that's approximately 36 by um, about the same size, actually. And I'm wondering, and I know that the the timings are not uh, not the same. It appears that this building is scheduled to be later in the process, but I'm wondering if there isn't a if these buildings were built as one building together, they both appear to be the same kind of thing, maintenance facilities, uh, if there wouldn't be a cost savings by doing a larger building that encompasses both um, opportunities at the same time. So anyway, that, that's my one comment uh, from just looking at it is whether there's not a savings that could be had by trying to combine both buildings. So, so we did look into that a little bit and spoke with the recreation. Um, the site that our building currently is at um, wouldn't accommodate um, a building twice the size. Um, and we felt that um, if you put it there, it would look totally out of place and look um, odd and awkward. Um, so that's why we proceeded um, singly by ourselves. Okay, and that's understandable. I just happened to see those thought, well, there, maybe there's an opportunity. Thank you. Yep, and one other comment to add to Patrick's was the uh, the concern about increased traffic that the if it was you also used as a uh, a multiple use facility, including recreation, there would be a lot of traffic going in and out of the uh, cemetery, and so for that reason, we uh, thought it would not be a preferable combination of uh, of efforts because we did seriously think about your uh, your question that you just raised. David, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, this is Laurel Stavis. And um, this is the cemetery that's divided into two parts, correct? There's the small Jewish cemetery, I think. Uh, so it's actually three. So the Jewish cemetery is across the street. And uh, we maintain that, but we actually don't own that. That's owned by the Upper Valley Jewish community. Um, but on the side where the building is, there is two cemeteries there as well, and they're divided by the last road. So the very last road closest to West Lebanon, that's um, Sacred Heart Cemetery. The remainder of it is Valley Cemetery. So can, can you show either on the screen or on a map or, or just describe the um, the relationship of where this building would be vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish cemetery, because there were some real issues there um, over the past winter with DOT um, storing some of their heavy equipment that was really impinging upon that cemetery. Yeah, um, so we did we did go over and speak with um, them about that. It's on the complete opposite side of the road. Road. So the Jewish cemetery is on the side where um, the condominiums and stuff are. Um, the Valley and Sacred Heart Cemetery 
are on. So you can see, so the Jewish cemetery is across the road. If you look at that map, Valley Cemetery in our buildings at the very back side, almost closest to the um, rail trail. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then one other item to add, Laurel, is that Miskoma Street uh, Bridge Project is scheduled to be wrapped up by the end of this month. So the uh, contractor who's performing that work for DOT should uh, clean up that site and be removed by uh, early fall. And uh, Christina Hall, uh, she can probably speak to this, but Park Construction, who used to use that site for the CSOs 11 and 12, they will prob they will be leaving that site as well. So it, it won't be used for construction for either of those contractors uh, once mid-fall ends. Thank you very much. Other questions? No, just uh, Pat, for scoring purposes, just to tell us which of the two is your most important. Um, I think because of the condition of the building, probably this one is the more important just for that reason. Um, I think the other project's pretty important too because it brings additional revenues for projects that we're doing. But um, for safety reasons, I feel that this one's probably the most important. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, continuing through those scoring criteria, uh, addresses an emergency or urgent public safety need? I give it a 15. This is actually an emergency. We're close to it. It's falling down. Other thoughts? Paul or Laurel? Well, I don't see it as the same kind of emergency that we would have with uh, the airport and the runway. But if, if the building's about ready to go, I think that it's at least urgent. Uh, so you know, I, would, I would think that that would, I, I'm not sure I would give it a 15. I might give it more of a 10 to a 12, uh, but certainly I think it, it looks like it needs to be done and done fairly soon. Laurel? I would agree with that. I... Sorry. That's all right. So, like a 12, 12 or 13? I would agree uh, 10 to 12. Okay. 12? 12, good. 12. Uh, corrects a known or anticipated deficiency? Now oh, it says becomes redundant, but the oh, first one, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree that it's uh, certainly deficient. Agree. Uh, provides capacity for future growth. Not really clear from the presentation. Yeah, I, I don't think that this particular one fits that as much as the mausoleum is going to fit that. Uh, if we consider, you know, afterlife is future growth. So um, at any rate, I, I don't think I would rate it very high in that particular category. Okay, so uh, one or two? Yeah, I can go with a one. Okay. I have to go with a one as well. Uh, results in long-term cost savings. No, I don't think it's applicable. No. no. Okay. Zero uh, supports job growth, job development, or increased tax base. I don't think that's applicable either. Yeah, I agree. Furthers the master plan or organizational plans. One or a two. Yeah, I, I would say either a one or a two. Well, break that tie. Yep, I would give it a one. Okay. Uh, leverages non-property tax revenues. Yeah, there's some revenue that comes in. So maybe a, a one or a two? Yeah. I'd say a one. Yeah, I would go with a one. And matching funds available for a limited time. Oh. Looks like a zero. Yeah. Right. Okay. Continuing on, we'll uh, move to the the second project, the Glenwood Cemetery Columbarium. So um, this is a project um, to add additional 
means of burial. Cremation in the state of New Hampshire and New England is somewhere around 75 to 80 percent. Um, we're probably going to see higher averages of that this year um, due to COVID. Um, the revenue that a columbarium um, creates is pretty substantial compared to a single grave. And the benefit of a columbarium is um, you can put it in locations that you wouldn't typically have traditional burials. So we're utilizing space um, that we wouldn't we wouldn't have typically utilized. Um, it also more often than not has some type of attraction. Um, so we kind of propose the uh, Glenwood Cemetery with the new fountain that the uh, fountain working group just donated. Um, we decided on two in this location as a starter. Um, the proposed idea is to eventually have four, so there's some room for growth there. Um, the size of them is the same, a little bit smaller than an average grave. Uh, on a single grave in Lebanon will allow six persons' human remains, um, one full burial with six cremations on top or six cremations total. Um, in this columbarium, it's got 64 niches. You can put two people, spouses, children, however you however you choose to separate them or do it. Um, and, and you can fit a total of 128, um, which is 122 more remains in that same gray space as a as a regular um, burial. Um, the revenue off of that on a weekday. So if you look at the breakdown, when I did a when I did a traditional burial, today's cost I used all weekend um, to give us the most profit or the most income that would come off of that grave, and that's three thousand fifty dollars um, with a columbarium in the same space. Um, there's a profit of forty seven thousand five hundred after you've paid for the cost of the columbarium. So um, total. Um, is obviously far more. <clears throat> I will note that in the packet that we provided, um, there is a section below that says, in addition, the city may realize additional revenues of the maintenance and preservation fee. Um, that is not something um, that would come in to affect anymore. We've changed that a little bit with the chapter 46 um, revisions that we put in front of council last night. Um, so that is not additional revenue that you would see. Um, so for the two columbariums there, um, total revenue after cost would be about 95,000. Um, they are becoming more popular. It's something that we're seeing a lot of in our national cemeteries, as well as um, like our veteran cemetery, Manchester Way. Um, our veteran cemetery alone is filling, theirs are twice the capacity of these and they're filling one to one and a half of these a year. Um, we're not gonna see that type of production out of it. Um, but it certainly will utilize space and bring us additional revenues, less maintenance in the cemeteries, um, less obstacles for the guys to be mowing weed whacking around. Imagine one structure that's square versus up to 122 monuments that would take up um, a tremendous amount of space and give obstacles for the guys to be mowing, weed whacking, spending time around, as well as repairing in the future. Um, these do also come with warranties. The companies that I spoke to, one of them in particular, has a 100-year warranty on it, um, which is pretty substantial. Um, so that's the breakdown of that project. Questions? So, Pat, I applaud your uh, mathematics. That was very helpful, but you didn't give us a time frame. So, a time frame as far as filling them? Yes, exactly. So you, you project a, a net revenue. Would that be over a five-year period or a 50-year period? Um, it's tough to say how many people are actually going to purchase it. Um, right away. Um, like I said, they're becoming increasingly more popular throughout the state. I'd like to see, we're doing we're doing somewhere around 50 cremations, 55, I think it was last year. We're going to see a higher number of that probably this year. Not all of them would traditionally go into this. Um, and it could be that somebody purchases that space because they want a specific space and they may purchase it 10 years in advance and not actually fill it and get the additional revenues of the opening and the engraving um so it's tough to say whether it's over a three-year period of time five-year period of time or up to even maybe 10-year period of time all right that's very helpful information thank you other questions before we score okay let's get into the scoring we've already 
highlighted that this is um, the second priority of the division, so it's, it would get a two. Yeah. The next uh, criterion is the emergency or public safety need. No. Doesn't, doesn't seem like it. Uh, is that a zero? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, known or anticipated deficiency in service or facility? Maybe, but not necessarily. Yeah, I don't see it as a deficiency, but it certainly is an is an add on. It's certainly a an opportunity. So, uh, efficiency. Maybe a two. Yeah, I'll go with a two. All right. Provides capacity for future growth. So, well, I think that's definitely. Yeah. Results in long-term cost savings? No. Seems like it could. Yeah, it could. Yeah, I, I think it could. saves time in, in future mowing. That's one example, but it also, you build a structure once and you know, then you fill it up. So I, I, yeah, I think that there is a cost saving. I don't know that it would be huge. You know, I'd give it a one or a two. Okay. Um, supports job development, increased tax base? No. No. Uh, furthers the master plan or organizational plan? Not clear. Pat, can you, is there a cemetery plan of any kind? As far as what, expanding those out or? Yeah, just uh, any kind of long-term plan that covers the, the future of the, of the cemeteries? Um, the idea is to kind of conserve as much space as we possibly can. So um, we're definitely utilizing our space more efficiently. Um, there is, as far as maintenance, um, we're working on a turf plan um, by introducing fescue um, grasses, which are darker green, slower growing to also cut down on the maintenance, um, as well as maintaining like tree growth around the sides, which is creating lichen. So we're not having these other projects such as our monument um, repair that we're doing right now that's costing us somewhere around $25,000 a year. Okay. So maybe for the furthering the goals of the plan, organizational plan, maybe it's a one or two? Sounds right. Yeah. yeah. Leverages non-property tax revenue. Seems like it. There's well, revenue. Yes. Yeah. Seems like it would. Matching funds for limited Limited availability? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Um, the next project for tonight is uh, the Mechanic Street Slayton Hill Road intersection, which I think uh, Jim said was Christina. Yeah, and before Christina starts this, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, so it looks like we have five roadway bridge inf infrastructure projects, including the Mechanic Street, the uh, Mount Support, uh, La Haye Street uh, intersection, the Spencer Street project, the South Main Street project, and the Hanover Street project. So did you want us, Can we'll go through and speak to each one of those, and then did you want DPW to rank them on a scale of one to five for each one? Um, I mean, does, just before you get into those reviews, is, is, does one of these projects rise above the others in terms of urgency and priority? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, Spencer Street's important if it's going to move ahead as part of the redevelopment of 20 Spencer Street. Uh, South Main Street is important just because of the age of the bridge and how long that project's been in the uh, planning process. Uh, so those two would rise pretty high. The US 4 Mechanic Street, that's not a, that's a 2029 construction project. So that would probably be, and Christine and everybody else, you can, you can chime in if you uh, have any comment. That that would because it's 19 or 2029 that would probably go to the lower level of priorities the mount support lahay well that's part of the 
development of two or three very significant size uh, projects in front of the planning board. So would that rise above Spencer Street and South Main Street? That's a good question. And then Hanover Street, that's a project that's being phased in over a, uh, a number of years. And so we just selected a portion of it for uh, for the first phase. So that probably could be a lower priority. So having said that, I guess uh, would appreciate some feedback as far as uh, what the planning board's thought is on the Mount Support La Haye and whether that's more important than Spencer Street or South Main Street. And Christina, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Um, well, as far as um, the South Main Street bridge, I mean, if you're looking at bridge construction projects versus um, actual road improvement or um, capacity projects, um, we definitely need the South Main Street bridge before it falls in. Um, so that I, I think that would rise to the top of all of the projects. Um, and, and we also are receiving funds for that project through the New Hampshire DOT. Um, even though it's, you know, in the future, the US 4 Mechanic Street, that's another one that's on the 10 year plan. So basically, um, you know, we have funding that we're receiving from the DOT on that project as well. So that's a lot less out of the city's pocket than some of the other projects that may um, come through, except I believe, you know, we will be, I believe we'll be receiving funds on the Mount Support project and, um, and, and, and some on the Spencer Street project. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think all of them are quite important. Um, and, but I do think it's um, the ones that see the most um, for the whole community are the South Main Street bridge project and um, well the Hanover Street US4 um, they really see a lot of traffic and put up in for for all modes of transportation so hey David this is Tom before yes. we further before we go further with this one what's the page number at the bottom of the page of the one that you're showing us right now uh, that is numbered 47. 47 okay uh, with jumping around with these uh, packets, things are a little bit out of place now. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I apologize that. On yeah. the scoring, in terms of the priority, it sounds like the South Main Street Bridge is a three. Um, yeah. Perhaps Spencer Street and Mount Support Road, La Haye, are, would be twos. Yeah. Um, and then maybe... Hanover Street reconstruction could be a one or a two, and Mechanic Slayton Hill would be a one, just because it's so sure. far in the future. Yeah, that, yeah. that sounds good. Committee feel okay with that? So Hanover Street's a one, South Main is a three, and the others are twos. Okay, so let's uh, move ahead with the, the Slayton Hill and Mechanic Street. Okay. Can, can you just remind me uh, what the, the scoring is? Is I'm sorry, but I'm trying to find pages and I'm losing my place here. But a, a one is represents what? Uh, the lowest priority for the department. And a three is the highest priority. So you're saying that the Route 4A Main Street, South Main Street Bridge is a low priority? No, I said that was a three. That was the highest priority. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So Mechanic Street at Slayton Hill. Okay. So the US 4 Mechanic Street um, corridor um, intersection, Slayton Hill intersection, um, has been um, in the works for quite a few years. Um, it is a subcomponent to um, the whole corridor study of a 1.3 mile roadway project um, that had been that had been programmed in the 10 year plan. 
Um, we were asked to um, break down the uh, corridor into uh, subcomponents, and um, this is one of the components, this intersection that rose to the top. Um, the first one being the High Street area intersection, and then this is the Slayton Hill uh, US 4 Mechanic Street intersection. So with this project, um, it um, it's the purpose is actually to increase the traffic flow, improve uh, the corridor aesthetics, provide safe pedestrian and bicycle accessibility, and address um, the operational deficiencies um, through this stretch of Mechanic Street. Um, we had gone to the Upper Valley uh, Xenopy Regional Planning Commission, and we had. Um, requested that they um, put this in the 10-year the plan in 18 and in uh, net the 19 plan, 10-year plan, it was, um, it did raise to the top for the whole area. And um, so it is now pro been programmed into the 10-year plan. Um, some of the things that um, this project would do, um, we've, we had gone out and um, with our the corridor study, we had looked at three different um, options in this area and the roundabout rose to the top. Um, it would actually um, take the railroad corridor, um, the old bridge there, um, and we would raise that bridge up, the walking bridge across the rail trail so that the ambulances and fire trucks would be able to actually access um, and get through the um, through that corridor. We do have APD that's right there, um, as long as well as other facilities, and um, and it really would produce um, a nice um, way in which to um, utilize um, Mechanic Street and Mascoma Street together. As you know, when we came through with the CSO project, um, you know there was work being done on Mechanic Street, we could reroute some of the traffic, maybe through Mascoma, but a lot of the vehicles couldn't fit. So this is this will be a project that will really help with the emergency, um, this, the emergency vehicles. Um, also, there's a bus stop that's right there in that vicinity. So this would actually provide um, access down to that bus stop with um, sidewalks and connectivity um, from the upper streets underneath um, underneath the uh, underpass, as well as access from off the rail trail. Um, and um, so it will, it's a, it's a good standalone project that will meld itself. So it'll have, like I said, help with traffic flow. It'll help with pedestrian um, safety and walkability. Um, and provide access up to the rail trail. Um, this was uh, programmed in the 10 year plan to start the actual design in year 2025, um, doing some right away in 27 and then actual go to construction in 2029. Um, the estimate is about a 5.1 uh, future dollars. Um, the DOT will be participating in, in that. Um, it's usually about an 80-20. This is projected to be higher than that, and we've known that, but we will be looking for additional funding as we move closer to that date. Okay. Um, questions from committee members? Tom, Laurel? No questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we've already determined that this is the priority of one. So the next question is addresses an uh, emergency or urgent public safety need. No. Something's happening for years to come, so there's no emergency or urgency. Okay. Uh, correct, say no or anticipated deficiency. Yep. Yes. Yep. 
uh, provides capacity for future growth. Yes. Absolutely. Results in long-term cost savings. Mm, not necessarily. Uh, yeah, I don't see that. Okay. Uh, supports job development or tax base. Possibly. Yeah, let, I, I would say probably a one. I, I, you know, it, it, it certainly will add aesthetically to the city, but I just, I'm not sure that it would, but I, I would give a one. I, you know, Tom, I disagree because I think Mechanic Street is going to see a complete redevelopment. We've got the apartment building going up, and I think that's just the beginning. Um, and sorting out that traffic intersection is going to help bring in other development along there. So I've given it to you. I'm just quickly. No, no, you've been with it a lot longer than I, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I do think the Mechanic Street is improving dramatically in just the four or five years that I've been here. Uh, certainly that underpass that leads up to Alice Peck Day, it would be an important thing to have increased. And, and I can certainly see growth along that, that uh, strip. So sure, I, I, I'm fine with that. So two? Yeah. Uh, Further the master plan. Or I'd see that. Yes, I think. <laughs> I'd say two. Yeah. I do have a question, though, if I may. Sure. Um, the the railroad bridge that um, is at that intersection of route. I guess it's Mechanic Street and. Can't remember. <laughs> Slayton Hill. Um, that's a historic structure, right? No. But, I mean, it's old. I don't know that it's historic in the full sense of the word. It's not, it's not like the Stone Arch Bridge on, on Glen Road is historic. Hmm. It, it, it has the um, Heritage Commission said anything about that structure? Not that I'm aware of, not the, not the bridge over Slayton Hill. Okay. Christina, are you aware of anything? Um, I I don't recall if that one is. We haven't we had not completed the um, NEPA for for that area. So that would come out um, as part of the DOT process that you know we would have to um, go through that complete process with NEPA. Um, but there is other there is other bridges that are similar to that one um, in in the areas. So sometimes that makes it not as significant as the ones where like they're you know more arched, like you were talking about. So but I, I anything but anything over 50 years can be considered um, yeah. historic. So I guess I like to say. I mean, I'm I'm sure. I that you're talking about. Which I'm sorry, there was a lot of over talking there. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure what that NEPA process is. The preservation is that New England Preservation? No, it's the National Environmental Protection Act, I believe. Yeah. So I guess <laughs> you know, what they have. But if anything, the Heritage Commission has to say about that structure. We can certainly ask, and it will come out as part of the, the review process because uh, federal funds would be involved in that project. Yep. David, this is Rebecca. Yes. yes. Um, I am fairly sure that a historic and cultural resources study was recently done by preservation company um, on Mechanic Street. Um, I don't know if it addressed that arch specifically, but um, that is something I am aware of. Okay, so we can look into that. Uh, any other questions on, I mean, the, let's see, we gave, um, we gave it a two on the master plan. Right. So the next one would be leveraging non property tax revenues. Yeah, the state's involved, so absolutely. Or I don't know if that's is matching funds to states, it's one or the other. 
Or it actually could end up being a cost if the state's involved. <laughs> um, let's see. Will we do this for other projects? Yeah, I think the we gave the airport project a three in this category because of the FAA funding. So I think it would be comparable to give this one, which will have some state funding uh, as as non property tax revenue. That would that would be the same. And the matching funds, we also gave the airport a three on that project as well. All right, just be consistent. So just for consistency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next project is where is actually the South Main Street Dry Bridge project. And for this one, uh, we'll, I will jump over to the supplemental packet that was passed out. Okay, and what page are you going to have, Dave? David? Oh boy, I apologize because it's it's the it's the first project in that packet. So it's <laughs> the title page and then the table of contents and then that. So it's the third page. Will you be able to share anything on the screen? Yes, I will. Hmm. Uh, can you see that? Yep. Okay. I don't know if this is Christina or Brian. Brian, do you want to speak to this? If not, I can. Let's see. Is Brian Vincent there still? Oh, yeah. He's still there. Brian? Let me start, and then if Brian is able to mic up, then he can uh, continue. So this is a project that's been going on for a very long time. Uh, the current estimate is $8.7 million, and it's available. It's eligible up to 80 20% with uh, DOT funding. The actual funding, because certain portions of it are not eligible, such as the access road down to the uh, uh, Rhymes Oil Company, as well as some of the uh, previous engineering studies that had been performed, and in order to bring it to the uh, the preliminary phase, some of those portions uh, were uh, re redone just to uh, because that the original design had a very much more expensive uh, option for the de for the design of the uh, the bridge, and the city. Uh, hired a second consultant who did a value engineering study and came up with an alternative approach. So presently, we are uh, we've submitted a proposal to DOT for the, the continuation or the of the preliminary design and final design, and we're awaiting uh, approval from DOT so we can proceed with that. The intent is that this project be final design by the end of 2021 so that it can go into construction in 2022 and it's a two-year construction project. Uh, the city's been waiting a very long time for this bridge. There's been repairs done to guardrails on it and as Christine uh, mentioned earlier, it's in uh, a deteriorated state so it uh, would be a very positive thing plus uh, it would improve uh, traffic flow through the area as it as traffic approaches uh, Main Street and Seminary Hill. And it would also provide improved access down to uh, uh, the oil company and a future park if that was ever developed as part of the, uh, uh, the railroad yard. So I have a question. Okay. Actually, I have a few questions. My understanding um, we fought very hard for an appropriation in the 2021 budget to demolish the Westboro Rail Yard buildings. And that project was closely tied, as I understand it, to the rehabilitation of the dry bridge. I may be wrong about that, but I'm putting it out there. 
My latest understanding about that appropriation is that it is on indefinite hold, that those buildings will not be coming down because of the state's funding situation with the COVID pandemic. Can you, do you know if the status of any matching funds from the state to address the dry bridge are also on hold? Uh, I can answer that question. My understanding is that the funds are still available. It was part of the 10-year uh, the plan that was approved uh, in 2020, and that's it, things could change. Um, maybe the city manager knows, and he, maybe he has a new news on the uh, New Hampshire DOT funds, but I haven't heard anything that's going to be taken away funds in 2022 for this project. Yes, actually, the governor made it quite clear that all projects that are not presently under construction are considered halted until the funding issue has been resolved. So that, that this project uh, and all others are being held up again, other than those that are already presently under construction and contract. And obviously this one is not. So this is in that status right now. So we're stuck on this. Yes, until the state deals with this funding issue and how that's going to deal with that long term. That applies to every single state uh, infrastructure project. So David, did you go to the other photo? This is the packet. Steve, I think you're looking for the Classics Road meeting. I Perhaps. clicked on the wrong one. Terrific. Thanks. No problem. Bye. Bye. Um, so this, this one? Yes. So to me, this is a real heartbreaker. This is the bridge over the railroad to nowhere that carries almost nothing. The service is what remains of blacktop. I don't know how many trains they run there, but we did a site visit, and at best it's a couple of them, right? This would be a much better project if the state, I guess, would simply end the railroad down by Rhymes, where it has a use, and then the city and state, could, instead of building a bridge, could fill this in and pave over it. We'd be done with it. I don't know how we go about achieving it, but to me, a bridge over a railroad to nowhere for nothing is just a huge waste of taxpayer money. We've been around and around this, and this is part of why this has been held up so long. I think there's not much we can do about that. I know there's nothing we can do about that at this point. That's rather clear. There is no changing that. So it took quite a bit of negotiation even to get that we would agree to this. Otherwise, this would be a $12 million bridge project. They wanted a tunnel and they wanted a whole bunch of other things in there. That, really? Yeah, we, would, we were able to get them to negotiate. And, they, and some of the things that Christina and Tal Jim talked about um, was they weren't going to participate at all in the access road to the Westboro Yard. And there is a, there's also an additional lane and there's a retaining wall for three seminary yards, a whole bunch of things in there that we were able to, at least we think, negotiate. Because I don't think we have a final word on that yet as to whether or not they've actually committed to those things. So I think we're done negotiating. It's, there's a plan, and that's the plan that's moving forward. And I don't see much shop in other than right now it's the state's financial situation. That's a real pity. Thank you. Brian. And the land is, um, you know, there's considerable confusion over federal jurisdiction of a rail, active rail line and state-owned land. There's, there's just no changing this. It's a short line freight railroad and it's owned by a private company and nothing we can do about it. Uh, Tom, any comments before we start uh, this one? Uh, so help me out to understand, are we still doing the one on the dry bridge or have we switched to this one? The dry bridge, obviously, to me, is a real critical uh, bridge. Every time I'm driving over that and get stopped at the stoplight, it's and I'm behind either a cement truck or have a big uh, truck carrying stone on that same bridge, it worries me because obviously we've had bridges that have collapsed, and this one sure looks like it's going to collapse. This other bridge, I really, I think, Bruce, uh, this is a bridge that was over there 
as we went into the um, Iron Horse project. That's right. Well, he's talking about the same bridge, I believe. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's the South Main it's Street so, Road the bridge. It's okay. the, railway, the railroad that we saw coming up into Iron Horse, Tom. Yeah. yeah. I guess that first picture I didn't realize was the same bridge. Yeah. It's a much aesthetically nice looking bridge than the one that I drive over. But yeah, so I think. This uh, to me, this is a critically urgent, uh, you know, project. And, I, you know, I hate the fact that the state might hold us up in getting this accomplished because the matching funds aren't going to be there. But I certainly see this as something that should have probably been done before and certainly shouldn't wait for later. So that's my comment. Yeah. Well, if, if I may just add um, a note of thanks to the city manager and the city council for the coordinated work that we all did over the last year with uh, in the legislature, with the Department of Transportation and with the governor's office to try and address some of the uh, terrible deficits in this area. And, um, and we are going to be working very hard in the next um, session to, to get that appropriation unbound and let go so that when we, so the dry bridge will be done and possibly those Westboro rail yard buildings will come down as well. So thank you, Sean. Okay, for scoring, we've already concluded that this is the top priority, so it gets a three. Uh, the next criterion is emergency or urgent public safety need. Yeah, I would put yeah, easily on that. Uh, corrects a known or anticipated deficiency in service or facility. Three. I think they have the absolute two, a three. Capacity for additional, uh, for future growth? Yes. I agree. Uh, results in long-term cost savings? Not clear. Yeah, I agree. Supports although, Go ahead. Uh, although if, if it in, improves the area's prospects for development, mm -hmm. it could well result in cost savings. Well, I think we're going to we're going to hit that in the next criteria. Uh, supports job development, increased tax base. Mm. I would say it, it would. Yes. Maybe I'll, uh, the same two that we gave to Mechanic Street Slayton Hill project. I think it's two. That sounds good. Uh, further some master plan and other organizational plans. At three. Is this in the master plan, David? Yes, I believe it is. And I, and I believe it's, it's certainly in the West Lebanon Village Charette uh, that was just done. Yeah, then it's a three. Uh, leverages non-property tax revenues. Again, I think we're waiting for the state to, to pony up its share of the money. So again, I think we gave, we gave threes for the other projects in that category. Uh, matching funds limited. Yeah. Okay. The next project is sorry to jump around. We're going back to the original uh, packet from September, uh, from August thirteenth for the Mount Sport Road La Haye Drive intersection project. And at the bottom of the page is number what? 50, 51. 51. 51. Okay, thank you. I will get up on the screen. 51. So is this, uh, I don't know if Brian, are you available for this one? Hello, this is Brian. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, back in business. Um, yeah, so so the planning board members are well aware of this we've had several discussions over the past few months during planning board meetings with respect to this 
intersection as it relates to pr proposed development projects along Mount Support Road as well as the hospital. So, but I will summarize it in general terms. Uh, effectively, the intersection is met its capacity even as of today in terms of traffic flow and movements, depending on which intersect, which uh, turn mo moment you're working at, looking at, uh, in the time of day you're looking at it. But it's it's met its you know uh, capability to carry traffic efficiently uh, during peak times. Um, and when you look at it with respect to the proposed developments, there's at least three and maybe four going on up there on Mount Sport Road, including the hospital, which is under construction currently um, for for a new wing. Um, so, so we we have asked, or the the applicants have done traffic studies that demonstrate uh, that this intersection would be further stressed based on the proposed de developments coming through the city along that corridor. So the need is definitely there um, and, and the the concern is is efficient traffic movement through the area um, is and as well as pedestrian improvements uh, would be incorporated into this that would give you better access to the hospital and then relieving the hospital area. Um, Okay. Again, I, you mentioned already that the, the planning board members are, are pretty well aware of this project. Um, board members, do you have questions? I can add one more thing, David. Sure. Um, this would be part of a special assessment district. So, in other words, that means the applicants would participate in helping fund these improvements. It wouldn't mean that the city doesn't fund it at all. It just means that the applicants would participate in funding as well as potential future applicants uh, that may come before the city for uh, land development and improvements. Okay. Uh, questions? We'll move to scoring then. <clears throat> Um, we've already we've determined that this was a division priority of two. So we'll uh, talk about the, the extent to which it addresses an emergency or urgent public safety need. Timer to I give it a 10. 10? Yeah. It's got to be there in time with all of these other developments where we're going to have nightmare of traffic. I, I would go along with Bruce on that one, especially since it's going to have a special assessment uh, district funding of at least a portion of the project. I think that, uh, you know, that helps with the urgency of getting this accomplished. Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree. Uh, addresses a known or anticipated deficiency in service. I think, I think that's that should be a three. Yep. Yeah. Uh, provides capacity for future growth. Certainly. Again, yes. Uh, results in long term cost savings. Not clear. Zero or don't be shy. No, nothing. Uh, supports job development or increased tax base? Yeah. Tax base. I think, yeah, I think both actually. Uh, oh, two, two or three? Three. I think, yeah, I think it's three. Okay. Further some master plan or other organizational plans? I give it a two. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. I would go along with that. Leverages non property tax revenue? Yes. Uh, yes. Matching funds limited? Yes. Three? Three. Okay. The next project is Spencer Improvements. Okay. Um, Ms. Brian, I can talk to that. Okay. Uh, so, Spencer Street 
is down next to Taylor Street. Um, it's in very poor condition or poor condition, I would say, currently uh, in terms of the road surface. Um, utilities, uh, the water utilities are currently in good condition based on some investigative work we did last week. It uh, looks like the water line is in good condition. The sewer line, um, we would initially, the proposal, as I understand it, is to line the current uh, sewer that's in the ground now that was installed in 1965 or 66. Uh, we've looked at the condition of that sewer line and it looks eligible or good to li line it, which presumably is cheaper than reconstruction. Um, the project itself is from the surface is going to be obviously roadway improvements, including curb and sidewalk, so pedestrian improvements. Um, there, there's not really a bike lane proposed, but I believe sharrows would be put in for bike access and egress. Um, uh, let's see. What else? Oh, the project would extend from the Northern Rail Trail through the Taylor Street intersection with Spencer Street all the way to, is it uh, Kendrick. Kendrick, Kendrick Street? Yes, so, and it, so it wouldn't extend through the tail end of Spencer Street. That's a much less used area with a few residential houses there. So the proposal would be just to Kendrick Street. Um, the work would also include improving the uh, the current drainage system, the closed drainage system, that is effectively, as we understand it, an old sewer system that was converted to drainage, so that that's in need of upgrading. Um, the project is driven also by the fact that the area is developing and we have potential other developers in the area um, that would be very pleased to see an upgraded street in this in this location. And this project is, I believe, very consistent with the master plan for the city. Work would happen 2021, if all goes well, with design occurring at the beginning of 2000, you know, and, and as of uh, January. So design from January to like probably April, including permitting, and then construction somewhere in the spring going through the summer. Okay, and this is tied in some in, in a funding sense to the 20 Spencer Street project. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, um, is my understanding. Yes. Uh, questions on this? Again, the board members may be knowledgeable of this issue um, relative to some of the recent projects that have come through the planning board, uh, as well as the discussions that have been had about the redevelopment. Uh, or the, the desired redevelopment of 20 Spencer Street. So just to quickly, the status, has that land been sold to developers? That's still under discussion. And what's your estimate of when the developer would come to the planning board? We, project? we are still negotiating a development agreement. We're, we've nailed down most of the issues. We hope to have that in front of the city council next month in September okay. to be signed uh, shortly thereafter, at which point the the developer would begin the permitting process through the fall and into the spring. It's, it is likely, well, I think the hope is that ultimately the two projects are almost under construction at the same time with the road, the final road work, final paving and, and construction of the sidewalk occurring in the spring of 22 when he's finishing his the exterior work on his site. Uh, so that we don't finish too early uh, and we don't finish too late for, okay. for, for his needs. Okay, I was just curious if the paper suggested the end of 21. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to, it's common for the city to, for a road project to get up through base paving and then let it sit for the winter and sort of settle and then do the final, the final coat of paving in the spring. And we would do that with uh, both the roadway and the sidewalk in this case. Turns out that the sidewalk is really the key piece um, where these two projects meet. Mm -hmm. Except that he has to base his stairs and setbacks and everything else off the sidewalk. So we don't want to finish that until uh, 
until we're pretty close on, on both projects. So David, this is Tom. Yes. And, and, and I really like the, this project for a number of reasons. I think that there's some real possibilities for future growth down in that area. And it certainly is, you know, right there in the center business uh, district area. Uh, I am concerned that it's the floodplain and how will the improvements that are being done, are, are those going to help with the potential of not eradicating flood, but at least keeping it so that there would be, I, I guess what I'm saying is I hate the idea of putting a lot of money into something that in 10 years is gonna be flooded out every 10 years. And so are we sure that that is gonna be a safe area to continue to develop? Uh, good question. By all, but based on the information that we have and that is available through the state uh, and their floodplain program, it looks like where the building is at 20 Spencer Street is above the flood elevation. Uh, so obviously the, the developer there, whoever that turns out to be, again, will um, need to comply with the flood plain requirements of both the city, uh, city's ordinance and the, the building codes. So there's, there's no question that he'll have to design uh, in accordance with those requirements. I'll let Brian speak to the, the impacts relative to the road project itself. Sure, yeah. Um, so the, in, the intent or the design intent for the road construction project is to have no net um, impact on the flood plain. So in other words, we wouldn't propose to fill in the floodplain. Any filling that we would propose to do would be compensated uh, somewhere on the project or somewhere off the project, but in the vicinity of Spencer Street. Um, most likely city owned property if we really had to do that. I'm thinking of Bagley Field, opposite side of um, the river. So, um, so the, the goal is to not impact the floodplain and everything that we build in that area and has been built in that area in recent years is flood resilient um, so that nobody's building structures not knowing what they're getting into they're building them knowing what what the implications are and how they should design and build them relative to flood resilient resiliency i have a question sure so if I live at the end of Spencer Street that you propose not to redo, what does that feel like to me if my end of the street is left in utter disrepair while the rest of the street is redone for new development? Is that ethical? Is it wise? David, I can speak to that. Yes, please. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, Laurel, that, that end of the street isn't actually in good condition. Um, it's, it's, the pavement is in, in very good condition. It's a, it's a very small, tight neighborhood there with smaller scale houses. Mm -hmm. I almost, my, my impression is that they would be pleased if we kind of left it alone. I don't know that, but that's my sense in, in working with the engineers on this project. Um, it, it's just, so, it's very, very quaint and neighborhood-like, and the condition of the road is, is actually very good. There, there um, will be a community conversation about this project uh, in the next few weeks, so that they'll be invited to that specifically, and they'll certainly have an opportunity to, to provide their comments and, and express their concerns. Right. And, and that takes care of it. That I just, you know, would hate to have the work proceed with them not being aware of the extent of it. David, this is Tom, and I have one other comment. And I don't know if Rebecca is still with us. I thought I heard her voice earlier. Yes, I think she may be. OK, well, she can maybe help us out with this. But in the, uh, in the uh, development committee that I serve on, uh, we were talking about lighting in the future and LED lighting and the need to have the lighting under, and boy, I, I wish uh, Matt was here. I'm, I'm here. Hey, so Rebecca, what, what is the lighting for the LEDs that we're trying to uh, see that it's 
somewhere around 2,000. It's 3,000 um, Kelvin. Well, 3,000 Kelvin, but we're, we're actually looking at, I mean, because that's what's available now, but didn't we talk about moving it down even further from 3,000? Well, the market availability of those products is not um, achievable right now, according to Councillor Bilo. So we can always amend that um, proposed requirement in the future to be even lower or uh, warmer LED requirement, but the current proposal that would go to planning board is for um, 3,000. Okay, well, so anyway, I just wanted to make make it known that we're really looking at that because of the dark sky uh, initiative and um, that if you, it's, I think it's at the U-Haul rental place where they have new LED lighting, but it's definitely not at 3000 or warmer. And uh, it puts out a significant amount of light, which is kind of blinding. So anyway, that, that was my only comment. I, I know in one of the other projects we had talked about uh, the last, in last week's meeting, um, LED lighting was mentioned also, and I just want to keep that in front of us that we do want to make sure that it's that we keep a standard that is going to allow us to have the dark sky. Yes, agreed. Um, any other questions before we score this one? Uh, we've already set the priority as a two. Um, the, the next criterion is emergency or urgent public safety need for this project? No. Zero or something? Can you talk about the pedestrian signals and whether a rail trail crosses from the street? Yeah, I, I can give it a one because having driven down through there, um, its state is not good. So, you know, I, I don't see it as an emergency, but I certainly see it as something from an urgent standpoint to make sure that it's upgraded. I agree. Okay, so maybe a... I think a, a one. I would give it at least... Uh, well, I, excuse me, I was thinking the one to threes. Um, you know, maybe a three to five. Looking at the other ways that we've done those. Yeah, Laura, good. Five. Yeah. I agree. Uh, corrects a known or anticipated deficiency. Certainly improves. So either a two or a three. I would go with a two. Yeah, me too. Provides capacity for future growth. Yes, three. Yes, three. Results in long term cost savings. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. Supports job development or increased tax base? Certainly yeah. increased tax base. Furthers the master plan or the other organizational plan, like the downtown vision study? Yes. Yes, three. Leverages non property tax revenues? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because it's, uh, it's tied to the sale. The funding is, is maybe tied to the sale of the 20 Spencer Street. Okay. Okay. And matching funds. Uh, be, beyond that, I don't know what other. I think the rest is uh, debt. Anticipated debt. Okay, that's fair. Uh, the next project uh, will be the Hanover Street reconstruction project. Um, and again, I want to. I'll jump back to the supplement. There was, I believe, this project was included in the original agenda packet for the 13th. Uh, but there's updated information and uh, details in the supplement. So that's what I will share. And again, it should be the second project. So does one replace the other? I was a little confused. Yes, the, the, the information in the supplement replaces the information from the third Thank you. Yes. Basically, the, 
The timing of this project changed. It was originally, the original packet, it was all pushed out to uh, the 2027 parking lot. Um, but we've, we've accelerated this project by replacing, essentially replacing what was previously called the infrastructure improvements for other roads. We've, we've designated that Hanover Street is going to be that other road in this case. So the money that was programmed for, for that project has now been moved over to this Hanover Street project. And I'll let, I'll let Jim or Brian or, or whoever speak to this. Yep, Erica's gonna speak to it, right Erica? Yep, I'm here, ready to go. Uh, so the original project, as, as David was describing, was from Route 120 down to the park. We are focusing on this intersection right here. This is the Hanover Street and Route 120 intersection. Uh, the focus of this will be the Route 120 approach will be converted from a stop condition to a free flow into Hanover Street. Um, to uh, eliminate any delay on the approach. This will be accomplished by creating a sweeping curve to align the two roadways end to end and to slow traffic approaching downtown. The minor Hanover Street southbound approach will tee onto the new Hanover Route 120 roadway. The intersection will not be signalized and there will be turn lanes on all three approaches. Uh, so the focus on the improvements on Hanover Street um, will go down to the Summer Street intersection and the design and reconstruction of the roadway, drainage infrastructure, water and wastewater infrastructure improvements, uh, pedestrian and biking accommodations along with landscaping and street lights. Okay, questions? So again, the, the funding for this project is anticipated um, it's tied into the 2024 time period, and it's just for that intersection of Route 120 and Hanover Street. The remaining parts of the corridor uh, down towards the High Street intersection are still programmed out in that 27 plus parking lot. So that, that, is, that is the change uh, from what was provided originally. Questions? Okay, we'll move into the scoring. Again, I believe we've already concluded that this is a priority number two. So the, uh, the, the first, the next criterion is urgent public safety need or an emergency. Sort of that, that intersection has been a safety need. Lots of discussions about that. Okay, so, uh, so one or two? Well, no, I give it five and a 15. Oh, five, right. Sorry, correct. I would agree. Yeah, I would also. It, it's always been kind of a mystery intersection. <laughs> okay, uh, and no or anticipated deficiency? Three. Uh, along with that provides capacity for growth not clear uh, so maybe a, a one yeah. or two yeah because in some respects i don't see it as too much different from the uh, roundup was talked about on mechanic street i mean it you know this so you know i would give it a two okay Results in long-term cost savings? Not, Not clear. Not clear. Yeah. Uh, supports job development and tax base? Not clear. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would I would look at it as at least a one or two. And the reason that I say that is that um, again, it's improving the downtown business district area. And that uh, anything that improves that certainly makes it more more desirable for businesses to locate in that area. So you know, I could see that it would could possibly provide some of that. So you, you gave Mechanic Street, Slayton Hill a two in this category. 
Yeah, so I, I, I would feel comfortable with the two also, again. Uh, furthers the master plan or another organizational plan? I think so. There. This, is, this was definitely uh, a key component of the visioning study for downtown. Then, then definitely a three. A three, you're right. Uh, leverages non-property tax revenue. No. No, don't see any. Yeah. Uh, matching funds limited. Nope. Nope. Okay. The next project for discussion is city hall renovation. So we've we've moved away from the roads now, and we're into a couple of different facility projects. Yeah. So we. This is Jim. We have two facilities project one is the city hall continuation and the other one is the uh, facility act facility plan and i see we have tad, tad montgomery has joined us so i'll speak to it and if tad has anything the energy and facilities manager if he has anything to add so so speaking with uh, city hall a number of projects were identified, which would be in addition to the current uh, project being under construction, which is approximately six and a half million dollars for, uh, and that's scheduled to be complete, completed by uh, November of this year. And sixteen projects were identified, which is on which are on pages uh, sixty-two and sixty-three of your uh, August thirteenth handout. And the project that was identified to move forward with as part of this uh, six-year CIP plan was uh, project number three, which is year 2021 improvements to the lobby restaurants. And that description on page 62 outlines all of the items that were included as part of that project number three. The other projects were put into a uh, placeholder or parking lot, as David referred to, in year 2027. Questions on this one? Okay. Then we will move into the scoring. I, I think it would be, uh, I guess I'll ask the committee, how, does, how do you feel about splitting out these two facility projects city hall and uh the facility assessment plan and allowing one of them to be a three in terms of priority three or two they're, they're a little bit separate from the roads they're certainly separate from water sewer yeah that's fair so, yeah so jim is the, the city hall you know completing yeah. city hall i hope yeah. you yeah. Talk to let me let me briefly speak to the facility assessment plan and that one uh, was an approved CIP in this current year and that's we're moving forward with that. We have a consultant Dubois and King that's uh, we're not quite under contract, but we're waiting for some uh, for some uh, final documents to get signed before we move under contract. But that project is moving forward and we would call that uh, phase one of the facility assessment plan and it'll look at. Uh, a number of buildings in the city including dpw garage and admin and the airport and uh the gar building and the kilton library and i think that covers everything so the purpose of the facility assessment plan is to identify any improvements that would need to be i need to be addressed as part of a future cip project for improvements and so the way we approach this facility assessment plan is this would be phase two, a phase two portion of the facility assessment plan where we would add a future date and we put it in a placeholder for $100,000 in year 2027, I believe, where we would take a look at other buildings in the city that hadn't been looked at as part of phase one. And... Uh, with the intent that some of the improvements that are identified as part of phase one would take place because those there may be some uh, glaring deficiencies that need to be addressed. Uh, Tad, did you want to add anything to that? That sounds like a good description to me, Jim. Okay. 
So between the two projects, City Hall and this facility assessment plan, uh, would you say City Hall is the higher priority? Oh, you asking me? Yes. Yes, I would say yes. Okay. All right, so we'll continue the scoring of the City Hall project, and then we'll, since you've already covered the facility assessment plan, we'll, we'll go right back through the scoring for that one. Um, addresses an emer emergency or urgent public safety need for City Hall renovation? Maybe a oh, we can't have a City Hall unless we finish it off, so. <laughs> At this point, we need to finish. We need to finish. Right. I, I'm not sure that from an emergency standpoint or urgent standpoint, but it's such a beautiful facility that, uh, you know, I agree it needs to be finished off. So um, how, how do we score it in, in B? Well, one of the important thing is we're going to have touchless features, which is very important in the COVID-19. So we don't have people touching hand dryers, we don't have them touching uh, sinks or, or toilet fixtures. So there's a public health need to uh, expedite this. That's why this one rose. One of the reasons why this rose to the top is to be able to deal with that particular issue. Good to know. Because right now you've got to touch everything in there because it's old, old equipment. So maybe. So how does the committee want to score this as a 10 or something? Yeah, or? give it a 10. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Collects a known or anticipated deficiency? Three. That's three. Yeah, it's a deficiency. Provides capacity for future growth? Three. Three. Results in long-term cost savings? It seems I like it's so. good. It does because we're going to be using less water because those are, yeah. uh, I call them low efficiency uh, fixtures. We're going to have high efficiency fixtures, fixtures and we have windows and a wall that's very cold. The heat is simply going out. That's That will help seal it up, reduce our energy cost and our consumption of water that we use. Right. And, and uh, definitely with the taking care of the maintenance of uh, the facility, the uh, exterior repointing of the maintenance of uh, the masonry and that uh, to me long term it's going to keep the facility from de uh, falling apart so that's got to provide some uh, results and cost savings okay so at least a two maybe three yeah. i'll go with a two I uh, it sounds good supports job development increased tax base I don't think so. No. Further, some master plan or other organizational plan. Three. All the front cover of the master plan. So. so I heard a three. And a three. A three. Three. Leverages non property tax revenue. No. no. Matching funds. No. No. Okay. And then the facility assessment plan. Again, this project is all out into the parking lot in terms of the funding. Uh, addresses. So we've set the priority there for two. Um, addresses an emergency or public safety need? I don't think so. No. No. Correct known or anticipated deficiency. Yeah. I'll give yeah. it a two. Yeah. No. Okay. Two? Yes. Too scary. Uh, provides capacity for future growth. A two. Results in long term cost savings. Not sure. Yeah, the plan itself will presumably not, but what comes out of the plan should. Right. Having been involved in a lot of places that had to do facilities assessments. I mean, it really does provide a real roadmap for what needs to be done. And some things that you don't really realize need to be done until you do an assessment like this. So I think there is some cost savings uh, to manage. Yeah. I remember, I, I believe we struggled with this scoring these kinds of projects last year. So um, maybe a two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, supports job development tax base? No. All right. Furthers the master plan and other plans? I'd give it a two. Yeah, again, two. Uh, leverages non property tax revenues? No. no. And matching funds? No. No. Okay, the next project, we're making good headway here. Water system improvements. And that would be Mr. Pirelli, I believe. So, Tom, we're page 66. All right. Thank you, Bruce. So, I guess to start this off, like we did with a couple of the other groups of projects, I'd like to talk about the priority between this and the new source study. That's the only other one that's presented for water tonight. Um, this um, capital improvement project for the water system improvements is going to be ongoing for years to come. That is the the plan as we're presenting it, and it comes from our fixed asset management program as it's been developed. We have the final draft of that from our consultant that identifies project areas, and this is the implementation of that plan. So I would put this as um, definitely the higher priority of the two. The other one is, is very important as well, but um, water system improvements would, would trump the new source study as, as far as I can see. So like I said, this is the um the the plan from our fixed asset management system being put into the works we are requesting the most money on the first year this specifically is to line the main on uh, the water main on the miracle mile it's a 1958 cast iron main and we've had seven major breaks on that main four of which i was present for so i would like to stop working on that in the middle of the night um, this is a, uh, a structural lining that we would be doing, so it would be similar to replacing it um, with a full trench and new pipe. Not really, but um, different from the sewer lining that we do, deeply trenchless technology, just because there's no main holes to get to it. Um, there's no openings to physically. Um, get into the pipe to do the lining. So there would be some trenching that we would have to do. Um, we're, we're looking at this lining because we don't want to dig up the entire road when we pave the Miracle Mile. So this is um, supposed to be done to minimize the impact of the pavement out there. So this is um, forever going forward, hopefully. We will be addressing aged valves and um, fire hydrants while we do this type of work. And that's pretty much it. Um, it is referenced in the master plan specifically um, in section 8D slash 4B. So um, it's definitely keeping with the city's goals moving forward to have that fixed management plan and to implement it. So that's that's about it for this project. Okay, questions? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll score this one. Uh, so we've got the priority set at three for the water system improvements. Uh, addresses an emergency or urgent public safety need. Sounds like it. it has an urgent need, so I would give it probably a you know somewhere in the 10 range. Yeah, me too. Okay. Corrects a known deficiency. Yes. Yes. Three. Provides capacity for future growth. Yes. Yes. Results in long-term cost savings. Probably. Maybe a two. Okay. Good. Supports job development and tax base. Uh, yes, I would think so. Maybe two. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> furthers the master plan. Sounds yes. like so. Uh, leverages non-property tax revenues. No. So yes, there's no property tax revenues involved. And matching funds. I don't. I don't know about it. Right. Okay. The 
the water, the new water supply source study. So this is um, a really neat project. This has been looked at a few times in the past. Most recently, I believe it was in 2009. And they looked at different belt sites that would be 1 million gallons or greater. They figured anything less than that would be um, not worth the, the effort of the city to explore. I, I do agree. Um, typically, our, our plant is is at about, um, well, it's less than half its capacity. It's capacity, it's greater than one MVD. It's about 1.5 million gallons per day production. So this would be to supplement our current source, which is the Mascoma River. Um, this would also provide redundancy to that plant in the event that for some reason that source were to become contaminated. Um, between that and our emergency interconnects, if the plant were to be compromised and we followed through with the project that would result from this study, and we would have a, a truly redundant source of water between the interconnects and this. So um, it's a it's a neat project. The current system that we're looking at would be um, close to the wastewater plant, further towards West Lebanon off of South Main Street, kind of behind the um, uh, Waterman Avenue, uh, Romano Circle. There is um, plenty of room back there. We, we looked at that this year and we're looking at um, potentially two different options as part of this study. There's um, another community in the state that did some radial wells beneath uh, Big River in their community. So we'd be looking at that and also looking at potential and it's called riverbank filtration. So that would require um, some additional treatment um, where a well might not, but it's um, certainly far less than the, the large drinking water plant that we have on pumping station road. So um, we're looking to kick this off and to, to get a plan to get this going for next year. And that's, about, that's what this is about. Okay, questions? Okay, we'll uh, we'll score it. Uh, we've already concluded that the priority is number two. Uh, emergency or urgent public safety need. No. I guess I have a question, and that is in in the document, and as well as what was just said, uh, we have a single source, which is the Muscoma River, and if that were to become polluted by an oil spill or something like that, we would be in jeopardy of using that water coming out of the uh, out of the river. So this provides a backup system for us. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so you know, from a standpoint of, uh, I hate to say it, but every you know, every now and then you do do hear of a river being polluted and it causing a problem with water system. It seems having a backup is a, is a fairly important thing to have. So, um, you know, I would at least look at it somewhere in the five to ten range on uh, an urgent public. I think I, I agree. I would agree with that, Tom. I do would point out that there is already some interconnections that the city has with Hanover and Hartford, Vermont, um, if we had to address an immediate issue. I don't know if Jay can, needs to, wants to speak to that. Well, that that's definitely correct. Um, there are some questions about the, the total capacity that we would be able to get from those interconnections. Um, if our plant was compromised, we would be you know, taking conservation measures throughout the city, of course. So we would we would probably be able to be served by those interconnections completely, um, but not as we know it today, where we just freely use water for whatever residents use it for. Ironically, uh, what Tom just talked about, and Jim can share the 1950s newspaper article where there was a Fuel oil truck that flipped over in the Mascom River and caused the very issue that Tom is speaking about. 
So not only does it happen from time to time in place to place, but it actually happened here at this very water plant, as Tom just talked about. And Jim can send you out that newspaper article from the 1950s that actually talked about that story and the kind of problems it caused in the city back then. Yes, I would be. I would share it, but I don't have access to my uh, computer S drive where it's located. But uh, I can send it. Uh, city manager. So I don't have it right in front of me either, but I can say um, we do have a contingency plan for that very problem. Um, when this happened, what was was told to me by some people who are no longer operating at the plant was we fed uh, we currently feed powder activated carbon as a treatment chemical to um, help with taste and odors they were able to increase that dosage to the point where it actually removed the oil as well um, obviously if we had a a significant spill right in front of our intake there would be a point where we would not be able to treat incoming oil but um, in the past when that did happen once we were able to produce water that met all the standards of the time uh, which which are a little bit different now so if we could do that um, without a boil water would remain to be seen but it would be um, far better than you know a, a glass half full of oil and water can, can you refresh my memory as to what prompted the boil water order a year or so ago? The most recent one uh, was a, a smaller one. It was isolated to an area um, in part of a construction project. The one that you're probably referring to um, was due to multiple E. coli hits. Um, that's a bacteria that we test in the water every month and it needs to come back negative or it indicates a problem with your system and, and the water's not safe to drink. So the one that you're remembering that was widespread was due to bacteria in the water. Um, it's unclear. I mean, I wasn't present on this role. I was working for the city at the time, but um, it's unclear if that was a sampling error or an actual contamination of the system but the rules are the same regardless so okay okay so tom mentioned a possible 10. i would uh, agree with that fine okay yeah. go. correct so known or anticipated deficiency yes, yes. Provides capacity for future growth. Yes. Yes. Results in long term cost savings? Probably. Not clear. Maybe a one? Sure. That, I think that's good. Yep. Supports job development, increased tax base? Not clear. One? Zero? Okay. Two? <laughs> I think, I guess the way I would look at it is if we've got the increased capacity to pump water, we've got the increased capacity to expand water service to, uh, you know, places that are developing. So I would see that it in the one to two range for sure. I would agree. Bruce. Bruce. Okay. 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 Frozen master, master plan or other organizational plan? I did not mention it um, like I did for the last project, but it actually is called out specifically in 8C-3A in the master plan, so. All right. So two or three? I think three. Three. Okay. Three. Uh, leverages non-property tax revenues? Not yes. Not funded by property taxes at all. In fact, none of these projects are the water fund. They're all by user fees. In this particular case, it's the sort of the water investment fee. No property taxes. So yes. Okay. So will it? But it won't generate revenues to support expenses. It just won't be paid for for property taxes. So maybe this is a two. Okay. All right. 
uh, matching funds. Back to where I got them. Okay. Uh, the next project is the Kuberg Sludge Dewatering Press. Um, so we have three uh, sewer wastewater projects. Um, last year, two of the ones that we are talking about, actually all three of them are on there, but um, the two most important, um, the Huber dewatering project and the sewer system rehabilitation project. Uh, last year, the sewer system re um, rehabilitation project was, was ranked number one. Um, for reasons that Eric is about to, to talk about, I would suggest that the Huber project be bumped up to number one at this point, just because of the work that's been done that Erica will mention in a few minutes. Um, so with that, this project was approved last year. It's been through preliminary design and the final design is currently being reviewed by NHDES to approve um, starting to charge the project towards their SRF loan, which is um, partial forgiveness. So this is like we've talked about last year. Um, in addition to the current system we have right now, we have two, uh, they're called uh, Huber or Huber 440s. They're just screw presses that um, try to pre-dry the sludge before it's it's hauled to the landfill so that we're not hauling wet heavy sludge down Route 12A and putting in our landfill. So this is pretty important and the reason I say it would be a one right now is we've done a lot of work since the sewer moratorium to improve our interceptor. Now that we've done that, we're approving additional projects that will utilize our sewer system. Once that sewer gets to the treatment plant, the sludge that's contained in that needs to be dewatered and the system we have currently is at capacity. So as these projects come on, we either need to optimize what we're doing or add capacity. So that is the basis for this project. Uh, the two 440s are rated for, uh, it doesn't really matter, it's um, the amount of sludge we get during peak dewatering. This 620 would almost double that, the unit's much larger. Uh, we did have to get creative with the space that did become an issue during preliminary design, which is part of the reason we're going for an additional an additional uh, 275,000. So with this project being done, um, this is the choke point at the plant now that stops it from reaching its um, 3.18 MGD potential. Um, with this project, we would be um, able to meet that design capacity. So uh, very important in my opinion, and um, we're already getting started with it. We're just looking for a supplemental at this point. Okay. Um, so this is your top priority. It, uh, how does the board feel about the uh, emergency or public safety need? And mixed feelings about it. So I have some some notes to maybe help the board. Um, if this system were to become overwhelmed, the ramifications of that, uh, th there's a couple options. Uh, we could lose our treatment process and pollute the river. Uh, not the best option. Um, second option, which ties into this ranking, um, you can hire mobile dewatering units. Um, they are tremendously expensive. They charge typically by the week. And so if this system were to become undersized due to new development, there is a way around that. I also set up a contingency plan with um, three other treatment plants, one in Vermont and two in New Hampshire, where they have agreed to take our sludge if we are unable to dewater it, but the hauling costs and then paying those other communities to do this for us um, is is very substantial. So um, there is uh, one 
Mary Thor option that sort of relates to uh, item B on this list. Thanks. So it sounds similar to sort of the redundancy effort with the, the new water su supply source for which you gave a 10. You know, I, I could go upwards of that, maybe an eight or a 10. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's not a really attractive thing to have to talk about and to do boy, it sure is necessary. And so, um, you know, I think it is a public safety need to make sure that we have the ability to process the wastewater the appropriate way and get rid of the, the sludge. So I, I think, you know, I would at least give it an eight. Okay. Other thoughts there? Have I still no, well, 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 most of the need was funded last year. This is a supplement to make sure that it's going to be the long-term solution. So, so we an eight. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, corrects a known or anticipated deficiency. Yeah, it's a deficiency in the long term. Yeah. Viability of our plant, so okay. give it a three. Provides capacity for future growth, certainly. Yeah. Results in long term cost savings. Well, it's certainly would keep us from having to pay somebody else to take it from us and, or, and to transport it to someplace else. So I would think that it would. Or maybe a one or a two. Yep. Yeah. Uh, supports job development and increased tax base. Possibly. Yeah, facilitates it. Maybe a two? Yeah. Uh, well, that sounds good. Furthers the master plan or other organizational plan? Not sure. I look for references for this one as well. Um, the original upgrade where the Hubers were put in is talked about in uh, 8C-4C, 4C. Um, this is, I mean, you could, you could technically, I guess, make a case that this is part of that, a continuation of that upgrade, although dewatering is not. Maybe a one or a two. Chase, the only one that could quote the master plan, so I give him a two. <laughs> right, I agree. Uh, leverages non property tax revenues. Again, this would be paid for through user fees. Yeah, and in sort of evolving fund projects, so there's loan forgiveness on that, and loan trust loans, so it doesn't matter at all. Matching, those be considered matching funds? Yes, the loan forget the uh, forgiveness plus SAG funds, it's on the list for SAG funding as well. Cool. So maybe a three. Sounds yeah. good. Okay, the Lebanon sewer system rehabilitation project. Great. That's uh, page 73 of the packet. Okay. Uh, so the uh, Sewer uh, rehabilitation projects. Um, this is, we started this last year. Uh, we've done two lining projects and an upgrade project down on Market Street um, uh, as work on the sewer interceptor. At this point right now, um, prior, prior to um, this year, we've worked on 22% replaced or aligned it. Uh, this year, we're, we've actually been able to do an additional 39% of the sewer interceptor, the Lebanon sewer interceptor, which runs from the wastewater treatment plant uh, through the end of Spencer Street. Um, so all in all, that section of the Lebanon interceptor, in, interceptor that was studied um, that had capacity issues with inflow and infiltration, um, will have completed work on about 61% of that interceptor. Uh, so 
the work, most of the work that we did is sewer lining, uh, which is hopefully doubling the life expectancy of the sewer interceptor. Uh, most of the sewer so interceptor is about 50 years old at this point, so we're expecting to get another 50 years out of it and also reduce the infiltration that was in um, heading into our sewer treatment plant that we were treating. So one of the uh, big areas that we addressed was trying to eliminate the, the infiltration into our system. Uh, moving forward, uh, we would like to also start looking at other areas, uh, addressing a lot of inflow that we still have. Uh, we've had 10 flow meters that we put in this year. We've been moving them around, finding out some really good information on future projects and um, so that's that's what we're looking at potentially doing in the future. We have a, a bunch of smaller little projects, but the, right now the majority of the interceptor, the Lebanon interceptor has been lined um, or rehabilitated at some point. Questions on this one? Yeah, I, I do have a question. You were mentioning that infiltration, so is that indicating that, that water is getting into the system from cracks and that's why it's being lined is that I'm not being an yeah. engineer okay uh does it work the opposite direction hydraulic pressure that the, that there's no sewage getting out but honestly um, we have roots in our interceptor it's old vitrified clay pipe from the late 60s early 70s um, so what this liner is doing, it's it's going in and it's actually creating a nice smooth surface, almost like a, uh, we had put in plastic pipe instead. Uh, so it's eliminating any root intrusions. It's eliminate, el eliminating any infiltration that's coming in. Last year's project, uh, we actually found we had a decent amount of infiltration and a lot of hydraulic pressure we lined underneath the Great Brook. And uh, it, you could definitely see in the lining and some of the issues that we were having lining it, the hydraulic pressure uh, that was actually coming in from the lining underneath the river. The majority of the interceptor is built um, between 14 and 20 feet deep. So, and runs along the Mascoma River. So we really do get a lot of infiltration, uh, especially in the springtime in that section, which is where we focused to eliminate the, the majority of the infiltration for sure. I think what Tom's trying to get at is if we don't line this, we don't fix this, we have the potential for a sewer line collapse, which could result in sewer backups in various places throughout the city. And that creates a public health issue. I think that's probably where Tom's going in on this. Exactly, thank you. Uh, other questions before we score? David, it sounds to me like this should be scored the same as the water system improvements. It's so similar. Okay. We already I mean, Jay, you said this is a priority level two? I think so. I might not agree with me. <laughs> I, I personally think my project is more important, but don't. <laughs> okay. okay, so. If we win with uh, similar scores with the water supply, or I'm sorry, the water system improvements, that would be a 10 for the emergency public safety need. Yeah. That's how good with that. Yeah. Three relative to the deficiency. Yeah. Three yeah. for future growth capacity. Yeah. Yes. Uh, two for long term cost savings. Yeah. Two yeah. for supporting job development and increased tax base. Yep. Yep. Three for the master plan. Yes. Two for property, uh, non property tax revenue, again, user fees. Yep. And zero for matching funds. Done. Well, again, you've got uh, SAG funds, you've got uh, low interest loans and loan forgiveness that we'll get out of those. Uh, for both projects, so we should did we give anything for the matching on the water. Uh, we gave us, we did not. It was a zero. So we should correct those. We should correct one, 
Right, because we'll be applying in the drinking water fund for those water projects. Okay, so threes for both? Twos for both? Yeah, threes for both. We get free money. Free yeah, money. I agree. <laughs> uh, okay, very good. Uh, next project is the septage receiving facility. Uh, so this is uh, priority number three, but um, this project, I did look into sources of funding for this. Um, some of you probably remember back in February of 2019, we did a septage pilot where we decreased our rates to um, attract more haulers. That was a, a very successful project. We we believe we're making about 50,000 extra dollars a year from septed receiving. Um, the current system um, can handle the septage that we're taking now. And we do believe we are near capacity as far as attracting haulers because much outside of the range that they're coming from now there are closer options even if some of them are more expensive they're close enough for them to justify going that way so the additional revenue that this upgrade could bring would be a um, grease receiving um, facility that would be incorporated into it uh, the potential for revenue from that um, is really in the, the baby stages of being analyzed. So I do not have a number today, but this project is, is not in 2021. So we have some time to hash that out. I did contact uh, NHDES to see if there was potential for any kind of grants or anything like that that would be eligible for this project. Um, several years ago, there are some communities around that were able to take advantage of that. However, that program is no longer um, in existence. Um, I can say that uh, through various things, um, um, RSA 468 that most of our projects that are federally funded fall into, um, they would be eligible for some forgiveness every community that we're able to sign a um, septage hauling agreement with um, would add two percent to our principal forgiveness plus so that um, if we were able to get enough communities could bring us up to 50 percent which was the amount i was quoted and if we were able to do that into a, in addition to a future grant that may be available and make money off the grease this could be a viable project but without all those things falling into place um this project may not happen so we want to leave it on the books because it does have the ability potentially to pay for itself um and we're going to try to figure that out as we get closer to the deadline so that is why we have it on for 2022 and um it's really to um to hopefully add grease to our receiving capabilities to increase revenues at the plant which we need to study and figure out first. Questions? Oh, so many questions. <laughs> but um, it's not the right time to ask them. OK, uh, we'll go ahead and score it then. We've set the priority on this one as a one. Um, urgency or the emergency need. Oh. Yeah, I don't see this one having that. It certainly has the possibility of increased revenue, but I don't see this as an emergency. No. Okay. Corrects a known or anticipated deficiency. Didn't seem to. So, uh, zero? Yeah. Uh, provides capacity for future growth. Maybe, not sure. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it seems like yeah. it would. Okay. Uh, results in long-term cost savings. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, didn't didn't wasn't it just explained to us that we could um, realize Sorry. what we knew from this? It's not cost savings; it's revenue generation. Yeah, that's different. Category. Yeah, that would be the non property tax revenue. Thank you. 
Uh, so being a zero there, uh, supports job development or increased tax base? I don't think so. No. Uh, furthers the master plan or other organizational plan? I don't think so. I don't know. Yeah, either. Is that no, I don't think so. It's maybe. Okay. Uh, leverages non property tax revenue? Yes. Yes. Matching funds. Oh. Yes, that's what we've talked about. Up to up to fifty percent matching funds. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Right. By signing up other communities. If all works out well. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Now the we're into the solid waste division. Uh, first one will be the phase three four design and permitting project. Okay, thanks, David. Thanks, Mark. Step right up. <laughs> okay, so I went through this, and you asked about a ranking. Um, for for me, this ranks. Um, I don't know that I would say that I have a bottom of the list, but it's lower on the priority list. Um, okay. And so the do... reason for that is because. Um, Oddly enough, COVID-19 has impacted uh, solid waste disposal generation um, nationwide, worldwide, frankly, um, which does impact capacity forecasting. So within the narrative, it says that, you know, we have nine to 12 years of disposal capacity remaining in our current cell. We'll know better in the spring exactly how this has impacted our capacity, um, but we have seen a you know, 20 to 30 percent drop in uh, delivered tonnage in the last six months, so uh, in the last four months, rather. Uh, so, 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 Mark, before you get started, um, of the of the five or six projects that are listed here for solid waste, which yeah. one, which one is your top priority? The top priority for, in my mind, is the uh, property acquisition. Okay. And is uh, with, and so the the three four design permitting is is it a one or is it a two? I mean, I'll let you have you can have several twos, but you can only have one three. So I would say it's a one then. Okay. Okay. Um, Phase three construction might also be a one. It would fall into the same category, yes, because phase three construction obviously takes place after design and permitting. So, and so yep. the others, the others might be twos. Correct. Okay. Close All right. twos. <laughs> yep. So I'll let you. Uh, I'll stop interrupting and let you continue with your presentation. Okay. So would you like me to go through the priority one, uh, priority threes first, uh, three first, and then go through that? Or how do you want me to handle this? No, you can, you can just take them in the order that they're listed. Sure. So th the three, four design and permitting, you, are, you're done with that presentation? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it, the reason it's three, four is because um, what we're planning on doing is actually permitting the entire site uh, so we don't have to go back to DES for um, subsequent permits. We've been permitting, you know, we have a phase one, a phase two, a phase two A, a two B, a two C, and we've permitted each phase of the landfill. Um, this plan is actually to permit the remaining disposal capacity available on site. So the phase three and four, um, Phase four is the excavation of the unlined landfill, um, lining that and uh, remediating that location and refilling it. So it's these are years out, uh, but it's permitting the entire site. Okay. Um, why don't you talk about the phase three construction and then we'll score both of those projects. Sure. So phase three construction is the construction portion of that. Um, which is to the south of the property. Um, phase three, um, the initial phase represents approximately six to eight acres um, on the site. Uh, we have started some of that preliminary design to get an understanding of this construction. 
Um, so, you know, this is, again, this is probably in the 12 years out kind of range uh, as far as construction goes. Okay, questions from the committee? You know, I do have one question. So, Mark, do you have any idea why there's been a 20 to 30 percent drop in uh, tonnage? Is it normal household kind of tonnage or are we talking about like construction waste or? Well, it's um, Dartmouth College closed. Every hotel, restaurant and ah. event venue closed. So it, it represents commercial and uh, entertainment waste. Uh, which is a fairly large portion of the waste stream. Uh, and we're at home. We're eating at home. We're not eating away. So it produce, we're producing less waste as a result of uh, these actions. Great. Thank you. Okay. We've already established the priority. Um, emergency or public safety need for these. We'll score them sort of jointly. Just, just. No. It's so long term. I don't know how you want to do this, David. Yes. Yeah, so, so maybe it's a zero? Yeah. So in terms of, the terms of urgency. Um, corrects a known deficiency or anticipated deficiency. I'd give that a two. Yeah, I mean it does, but it corrects it 12 years out, which is great. Um We've got a plan for the future, but yeah, probably maybe a two. To be clear, the, the construction is 12 years out, but the permitting takes between four and five years. That's why we have it kind of incremental over the next several years is it takes a long time to permit uh, with the state and uh, there's it's a long process. Can, okay. You no, know, can you tell me what the reason for that long process is? Well, for instance, we have to demonstrate um, an understanding of the hydrogeology of the area we want to expand into. And to do that, you have to do that two years before your construction. And to do that, you need to have a hydrogeological work plan, which can take up to 18 months to develop and get approved through the state. So just the hydrogeology, you're at three and a half years before construction. Uh, and then when you back out construction, you've got design and um, contract bidding. And, you know, so you're in four or five years before construction. Just the entire process is time cons is long. It's not time consuming. It's just sure. long. Yeah. Huh. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Provides capacity for future growth. Yes. Definitely. Uh, results in long-term cost savings. No hmm. choice. Okay, um, like a one or yeah. Or you want to Mark, did you want to comment on the getting it all permitted now as opposed to having yeah. to go back time and time again? It's really an economy of scale. I mean, to go back and forth to the state, these years of of development and paperwork and applications and uh, you know it's expensive to work with uh, with some of these consultants. Uh, so by doing it all at once, it you know it's a lot of money, but it's less money to get it all done at once. Um, the other thing about um, you know savings, by virtue of having a landfill close to us, it is a savings. Uh, if we had to transport this waste elsewhere, the, the cost for disposal would would be at, at a minimum 30% higher than what we're currently paying. Yeah. So in terms of long-term cost savings, what's the committee's thought? That's a guess. Yeah. yeah, I would say at least two, two three, yeah. Okay. Supports job development, increased tax base. That's necessary for the development of the city, so. Right. So maybe a two? Yeah. Or there's a master plan or other organizational plans. 
I would, I don't know yes. specifically in the master plan, but it certainly is supportive of the master plan. If, if things are going to happen, uh, having solid waste disposal has got to be something that we've got, I have, so. Yeah. There, is a, there is a landfill or solid waste business plan. Yeah. This All right. is integral to. So at least the two, maybe yeah. three? The two is good. Two is good. Mm -hmm. I'll go with that. Leverage is non property <coughs> tax revenue. Yeah, Mark is a revenue source. Two or three? I would think that it's probably a three. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how the city charges for waste disposal necessarily, uh, but I would imagine all of the citizens within the space area are paying a fee to have their trash hauled. Am I correct, Mark? <laughs> yeah, did you want tip fee 101, Tom? Pardon me? Did you want tip fee 101? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we still got several projects to go through. Sure. All right. Um, ma matching funds? No. Are no. Okay. All right. The next one is the gas collection and control system. Okay. So for me, this was a level, this was a priority number two. Um, the money increases over time primarily because of increased construction costs. Um, the cost to install gas wells is based on a per foot cost. So as we fill the landfill, it gets thicker. So the per foot cost is might still be the same, but now the well has to go deeper. So it's more expensive over time. Um, but it's a compliance issue. Uh, we're obligated to uh, control odors as well as uh, the generation and management of landfill gases at that site. Questions? Okay. Um, I'll see if I can go through the scoring without putting it on the screen. Um, priority is two, addresses emergency or public safety need. Hmm. You said this was an obligation, Mark? Uh, yes, our, our permit and state rule requires it. Um, it also kind of dovetails into our uh, gas to energy project. So. Ten. Ten. Ten? Yeah. Okay, I'll go with that. Correct, so no anticipated deficiency in service or facility. Yes. Uh, provides capacity for future growth. Yes. Yes. Results in long-term cost savings. Uh, yes. Right. Especially if we can use that gas in generation of power. That, that would be revenue. Yeah, I, I understand that. But, right, okay. It is safe. All so right. Maybe, so maybe the cost savings is a two? Sure. Supports job development and increased tax support. I would think yeah. so. Uh, two or one? Yeah, one. Uh, furthers the master plan or other organizational plan? Well, it certainly has to be supportive of the uh, landfill plan. Mm -hmm. Especially if we're converting eventually the gas into power. Yeah, so say two there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, leverages non property tax revenue. Three. Yes. Yeah. And matching funds. Don't know. Don't know. Don't anything about matching funds. Okay. Um, the next one is the PFAS preliminary study. Okay. Uh, this is, you know, in the in the two priority uh, category. It's uh, it falls into a compliance issue. PFAS is a is a new 
an emerging contaminant, um, also referred to as the forever chemical. Um, it's in everything. Uh, and we throw stuff away like our Teflon pans and jackets, and it ends up in the landfill. So this, um, this study is to determine where is it coming from? Where is it going? How do we manage it? So uh, that's how that's what this project is. OK. Um, priority two addresses emergency or public safety need. That's a very high for me. I think it's a very high what? It's a, it's a public health issue. Right. I mean, it's, it's not addressing the issue, it's it's evaluating the issue, right? Correct. But before you can address the issue, you have to evaluate it. Right. We need to better understand where is it coming from, where is it going, what's the transport, and what are some existing technologies out there. There's, there's a lot happening right now, but what are some uh, legitimate technologies to for treating and uh, uh, addressing this contaminant? Seems like a pretty important public health issue to me. Yeah, I agree. Um, so you want to call it a 10? Yeah, yeah. I, I would think so, yeah. Okay, correct a known or anticipated deficiency. Yes. I'd give that a two. Right. Okay, capacity for future growth? Not necessarily. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, results in long-term cost savings. Only if it allows us to figure out how we're going to have to deal with it and we don't have to deal with it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, it, it, hmm. I don't think it does. I, uh, okay. No, this is just an expense. Okay. Uh, zero. Supports job development or increased tax base? No. Not no. necessarily. Not yet. Further some master plan or other organizational plan. It this almost is... sounds like it does from the standpoint that we may be required to know what to do with it. Uh, Mark, is this a, like back in the 19, this is well before your time, but back in the 1960s and that when PC, uh, when, uh, uh, leaking PCBs out of uh, various different electronic things were first coming online. People were becoming aware of it. Is it the same kind of thing? It's, it's comparable, yes. Yeah. That's why it's called an emerging contaminant, because there's not a lot known about it. Right. So um, zero or one? One. One. Leverage is non property tax revenues? No. Yes. Yes. Laurel has passed a bill that uh, allows the uh, treasurer to borrow $50 million and uh, there's potential for up to 50% reimbursement if the state wins the present lawsuit that has against three companies that produce PFAS. So I'm yep. not Laurel. Yes. Yep. <laughs> well done, municipal and county government. <laughs> So that is, are those matching funds or is that revenue? There would be matching funds that they would provide to us if they're successful with their lawsuit. And then there would be the low interest loans to pay for these things. So maybe the revenue, the study is not going to generate revenue by itself, but there may be matching funds. It's matching funds. Yeah. Okay. Uh, property acquisition. <laughs> Top priority. Yeah, so this for me is is a top priority, um, primarily because it's it was called out in our in our most recent business plan as an opportunity to expand capacity. Um, it wouldn't be something we would realize for quite some time, but it would require some planning and development. Um, it's an opportunity that exists right now. Um, it does add as much as 20 to 25 years of disposal capacity to uh, uh, for Lebanon's landfill. Um, the idea is that the property would not be used as a landfill, but it would allow us to move our facilities next door 
and develop uh, 370 Plainfield Road as um, as a complete landfill. Um, it doesn't allow us to make poor choices. Uh, it just gives us um, additional disposal capacity um, uh, for the city of Lebanon. What do you mean by poor choices? So some might say, well, if we've got more disposal capacity, we can just throw more stuff away. We don't have to recycle and compost food waste and stuff like that. Um, we, we still have to manage it as a finite resource. It just pushes us out further into the future. So, Mark, I don't understand the financial part of it. The $75,000. So that is just to perform um, a level one and level two environmental assessment on the property. So we didn't budget to purchase the property at this time because we've not negotiated a price. Um, we are talking with the owners, but um, we need to determine just what is on that property. So that money is set aside primarily to assess the property um, and what might be on it. Okay. Okay. Other questions before we score? Okay, top priority um, addresses an emergency or public safety need. Well, this is one that I'd like to give a real high score on that, but I'm not sure how I would fit it in. Uh, I mean, I, what 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 phase inspection is this going to be, Mark? What phase of the landfill would this impact? No, what phase, what kind of environmental study to know what was on the property? Is it going to be a phase one or is it? it it's a phase one and two. One and two, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it seems like it's a real opportunity to miss if this land is out. So, I, you know, I think from a future need for public uh, safety, it's probably there, but how to score it. Yeah, it seems, I don't know, it seems like a bonus. If we can take advantage of it, but I would I, give it a bonus to our Yeah, doesn't seem like an emergency. No, or an urgent public safety need. No. Uh, corrects a known or anticipated deficiency. Yes. Three or two. A two. Provides capacity for future growth. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. That's great. Results in long term cost savings. Again, if we look at, we won't have to have somebody haul our stuff away someplace else to land it far away. I think it does. Other thoughts? What's it? One, two, three. I do. Two. I'd give it a two. Supports job development and increased tax base. The study itself won't, but certainly the end result has the potential. So one or two? I would give it at least a two. Can I ask one other question of Mark? Sure. And that is, Okay, so Mark, let's assume that we do the study and the study pans out. It's you know it's a good piece of property. It's not contaminated in any fashion, uh, and we go we can go with it. How, when, and how will you get the funds to actually purchase the property? Are there other funds available within the city to be able to do that, or do do we have to go through? Will it be brought to us next year? Um, as That's, that will all depend on you know the, the speed at which we're able to to get to those places and how quickly these uh, assessments take and uh, it, it'll definitely be a, a very public process okay all right 
to, to answer Tom's question, we would bond the money. If we are able to come to some agreement before the end of the year, we would include it in the, uh, the, the capital projects that the council approved in 2021, and that money would have to be borrowed for a bond. Uh, if it goes into, into during some time during the year 2021, that may require supplemental appropriation by the council, which again would be a bond. Thanks, Sean. That, that helps understand. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, this sounds like a really good project. Right, so supporting job development, increased tax base? Yes, I think so. Maybe two? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, further to the master plan, I think Mark already suggested that that, that is the case. Or the okay. organizational plan. Right. Two I think it's three. Three? I would. Uh, again, this is the future of this landfill, so yes. Leverages non-property tax revenue? Not sure. Yeah, the study itself doesn't, but the end result does. And then the matching funds? I don't think so. No. Uh, the last landfill, last solid waste project is the gas to energy project, and this is Liberty Utility upgrades, I think. Yeah, we had we had put that in there um, because at the time the um, it was looking like we were going to need a whole lot of money to do some significant upgrades to the Slayton Hill substation. Um, but we're waiting for some final numbers from Liberty to make that determination. So we're gonna we're kind of hitting the pause button right now to to evaluate that. And this is in order to effectuate the gas to energy, is that right? Correct. That's what would take place. Okay. So this is similar to what Jay mentioned earlier. Yes, the project is is a prior CIP project that has funding, but this would be additional funds for that project. And all we're doing now is we're just waiting for those final numbers, um, what they're where they're going to land. OK, so priority level two addresses an emergency or public safety need. No. No. Okay. This is one of those that I really like, but I can't see that it's an emergency. Yeah. Corrects a known or anticipated deficiency. Not clear. Well, I guess I got to ask the obvious question: What impact does a million dollars have on the overall profitability of the gas to? Right, they're, they're reduced, and that's part of it. That's what Mark's trying to get at without getting far down the road in the details. We got to make a determination whether or not that tanks the project, right. even if that's the right dollar amount. That's a whole other question, and there's another there's other options that we're looking at. So it really so this is all up in the air. It really is, and, and Mark, we put it in the air as a place marker, but it may not be necessary at all because the other option doesn't require any funding whatsoever from us. So. You know, like Mark, I think we, we've got to put something in there right now. It's in front of us right at the moment, but by the time we get to December, it may not even be there. Okay, that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you. So, in terms of the def deficiency, is that a one or two? Well, can, let me ask one other question about that. So right now, the gas that's coming off of the landfill, do we burn it off, or is it just? going up into the atmosphere is the methane gas coming out what it is what currently it's currently being flared so this the engine does not address a public health issue it just takes that burning and does something productive with the gas so it it doesn't change the nature of the um of the emissions it okay. could potentially reduce them but not not considerably okay but I don't think scoring makes any sense on this one. Okay. Um, so I don't know how you want to fudge it because we'll just go around and sort of. It's kind of insane, and, and you know, we get better that it might be more that we come back to unless you score this one. We, we get some more solid information. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
Okay. I, I understand why it's there, but it's just, we hope to have that in the next few weeks so we can come back to you and say, well, okay, here's the updated data. Right. And you can have a better indicator. Uh, All right. So we'll just pause on scoring for that. So. Yeah. I think that completes, that completes our public works projects brings us back around. Thank you to all of the Public Works folks who participated tonight. Um, that brings us back to some of the planning projects that did not get covered at the last meeting. And I will cover those and Rebecca can ship in as appropriate. The first one will be the climate Climate Action Plan. This is an effort related to <clears throat> what page are you at? I'm sorry, we are on. This is in the original packet, yeah. and it's page 27. Nice. So, for the last several years, LEAC has been working uh, on taking different steps to address climate climate action and uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. Most of the most of the actions that they're working on have were generated and, and are listed in the in the 2012 master plan. In the last couple of years, we've had a greenhouse gas inventory uh, study updated through a, a UNH fellow, and that sort of gave us a, a, a fresh look at how much we've achieved since 2012. Um, but what this study would do is give us the next list of projects for the city to, to work on and, and undertake in order to continue reducing greenhouse gas emissions to, to actually hit the target, uh, which is to be at 90, uh, 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2020, which is part of the New Hampshire Climate Action Plan. Uh, so this again, this is a study to help us know what the next next actions should be relative to greenhouse gas emissions. Rebecca, do you want to, you, is there, would you like to add anything to that? Hi, I was not in, um, directly involved with this. Um, however, if you go through a number of the chapters in the master plan, whether it's natural resources or transportation or energy, um, it's it's clear that um, by addressing the the climate action needs of the community, we're really um, addressing many goals um, across our master plan. So it, it's it's not just um, energy; it's it's environmental quality, it's social equity, it's it's many other things as well. Yeah. Uh, so this this is Tom. I've got a, I, I do have a question. <laughs> Because I'm not sure that I'm reading this correctly, but it looks like no funding is necessary for this until 2027. Is that correct? Well, no. We had proposed uh, we had proposed 100,000 for 2021, but this is we talked about this last time. Uh, we've got a limited amount of dollars to spend in the six-year period, and it's equivalent to what we anticipate. Um, reducing the, the, the principal, or, or what's the right word? Um, the, the amount of principal that will be retired from general fund supported debt. So we're trying to not take on new general fund supported debt in a, in a larger amount. So decisions had to be made to get us down to that $20.7 million for the, for right. the six year period. And this is one of the projects that got bumped out into the parking lot because it's it's one of the things that we may not be able to afford. So tell me, just to also put a finer point on it, I'd much rather spend money on things that are actually improving the environment, like electric vehicles and installation in buildings and reducing our impact on the environment, things that actually do that compared to putting a plan together. It's important to have a plan, but there are things we know that we can do right now I'd rather spend that hundred thousand dollars in ways that can actually impact the environment right away because it is a crisis that needs to be dealt with so in terms of making my assessment i'd say well i'd rather spend my money on doing things that actually produce results 
than uh, putting efforts into a plan because I know what those things are already. They're already in front of us, uh, reducing our, uh, our, our emissions from street lights and buildings in terms of uh, energy loss. That's where I'd rather invest that money. So that's a decision I made. Okay, so, so Sean, it sounds like there is a plan, whether the plan's in your head or or the can, uh, collective city planning and various different offices uh, plan, it's there. Um, I, I always go back to some of my background, which is the public relations standpoint with as much in the news as, uh, you know, environmental issues are. Uh, it, does this have any kind of negative impact from a public relations stand if we don't have a plan per se, but we actually do what you're talking about, and that is actually, you know, doing things that are going to impact uh, the environment by having vehicles that are electric ve vehicles, et cetera. Uh, I'm not sure I'm making this very clear, but. Um, well, I understand what Tom is saying. I think that uh, one thing that a climate action plan does is it's essentially a business plan for where you prioritize your investments in um, carbon reduction and related greenhouse gases. So we're, while we have some very clear strategies that will be effective in terms of building upgrades and, and similarly, it doesn't necessarily account for and give us credit for and, and identify opportunities and in turn make us um, maybe eligible for grants, for example, um, in terms of communications as relates to other um, like open space and carbon offset or other renewable energy types that are on top of the current solar investments. So a climate action plan is like a business plan that can address arenas beyond what we're um, already looking at and, and help measure our success and, and benchmark it to others. Right now, we're, we're just by the seat of our pants trying to address these urgent needs. Except it sounded to me as though what Sean was describing as anything but seat of the pants. Yeah, Sounds it's not seat of the well, build, buildings are not the only picture. So there's transportation is actually the greatest factor in um, New Hampshire in contributing to climate change, for example. So it's also um, a question of whether a climate action plan would be just city facilities and equipment or community wide. And as you, you might um, be aware there are many in the community, including uh, Sustainable Lebanon, for example, that would argue that we need to be acting as a community, um, not just city operations. So we're doing a, a very strong job with city operations, and this would extend the, um, the scope of what we account for and have opportunities to improve. Yeah, again, there's a, there, are, there are a lot of actions and strategies spelled out in the 2012 master plan, and we're continuing to uh, work on those and address those. Um, but that list is getting shorter as we, we, we address the, the low hanging fruit. Um, and so again, we're, the idea of this plan is to, is, is to extend the, the list of projects that we can consider and, and have, have more information about which ones will be most uh, effective and, and and feasible and in in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions for the, the, the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak. So right. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's more there's more to do um, that we already know about, but but we're looking ahead. Okay, so let me. I don't. I don't want to drag it out too much further. Uh, where I'm going with this is: Do we know that this study would actually cost a hundred thousand? And the reason that I'm asking that is that I, in other places that I've been, they've done studies like this where they've had um, studies actually uh, gratis from organizations that would do studies. And I'm just wondering. I, I don't want to not have a study that provides us with a roadmap to the future for being able to do this because of, again the, the public relations aspect from it's such a current hot topic in the uh, to you 
kind of step on my words uh, in the environment um, that I, I don't want us to miss an opportunity and to look bad when actually we're doing things that are actually very good. But I also don't want to spend the money if we've got another avenue by which we could have this study done and provide for the city exactly what's needed, uh, but maybe do it in an expense-free method. And I don't have an answer for that, but I'm just throwing that out. So Yeah, Mark, Mark Goodwin in the planning office did a lot of the research and, and talked with other communities. Uh, and there's a pretty broad spectrum of, of, of costs and products out there. Uh, for communities like Somerville, Mass, Keene, uh, Northampton, Mass, I mean, they've spent double that, that amount. They've spent well over you know, $200,000 on these plans. Other communities have done it for 25 to 50. Uh, so again, the 100,000 was in some sense a placeholder. Uh, sure you know, sort of middle of the range in terms of what different communities have available. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, other questions before we try to score this one? Yes, I have a question. Yes. If I can put this into words. Will committing or emphasizing this $100,000 for this study have a negative impact on any of those action items that we want to do now? Action items related to greenhouse gas reduction? Yeah. The simple answer is yes, because the money has to come from someplace. That means that means that some of the project has to be cut. Well, that's exactly what I'm getting at. Are we are we doing are we engaging in a political exercise or a PR exercise to the detriment of things that we know need to be done and we could well use those dollars to do those things. Uh, I think so, Laurel, because this money is 2027 and plus. Right, but they wanted to do this study next year. I don't, I don't think it's a PR exercise. There is certainly value, there's definite value, real value in doing the study. The thing is we already have a rather long list of things that we can do right now that have an impact on the environment, and I don't even have enough money to do all of those. So I'd rather get as many of those things done and have a real reduction in greenhouse gas with the money that I do have than to spend a study than to spend money to do a study that will tell us that give us a whole other list, but I can't even address all the issues in the first list. So it makes a lot more sense to chip away at those, get as many of those as I can done, and by the time we get to the end of those. We'll probably be pretty close to 2027 anyway, and then we can fund the study to do the rest. And also, by the way, the other communities that did these studies, they already had those recommendations. All we have to do is re read those reports, use the materials they have, and actually implement those suggestions that they have in those other communities right here in our own without having to do an independent study to figure those things out. Well, and that's kind of where I was going, Sean, is, that, is there a way in which we could do this internally? Uh, <laughs> I hate to say plagiarizing from others, but other people have already done the studies and all we have to do is follow a game plan that's already out there. There's no sense in, in re, uh, reinventing the wheel. Uh, there are you know, guides that are out there. But it sounds like we already have enough projects to be able to do with monies that we have available at this point in time. A study out in the future is the more important thing. So let's figure out how to rate this. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I, gave, I, I already gave the airport TIF project my top ranking. Uh, so I would give this one a two. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of uh, addressing emergency or urgent public safety needs. No. No. Yeah, I don't see it. Okay. Anticipated deficiency, known or anticipated deficiency? No. Is that, was that a no? That's a no. Okay. Capacity for future growth? No. Long-term cost savings. Again, the plan not may not in and of itself, but the, the results of the plan 
possible. Theoretically, it would. Just hypothetical. Yeah. Similar. I think we gave the assess facility assessment planning too in that category. Yep. I, I think it's more of a hypothetical statement, but Ken, the, these things, if we continue to do the things we're doing right now, it's going to cost more and more to live on this planet. So the more of these things we can do to preserve that, that will have long-term impacts and long-term cost reductions, which is why we're actually doing the things to reduce the gas and other issues in the first place. So there is an impact, valuable impact, tangible one. So long-term <laughs> cost savings too? Yeah. Okay. Supports job development, tax, increased tax base. I'd give it a two because it makes Lebanon more attractive. More attractive for a little place. I will, I will advocate for that. Uh, furthers the master plan? Absolutely. Uh, leverages non property tax revenues? No, not really. Matching funds? Not no. Uh, the next project is the Complete Streets Multimodal Plan, and I would like to have Rebecca cover this, if I could. Hi, just let me unmute myself. Thanks. Um, David, I think you're, are you still sharing your screen? I am. I just scrolled it forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, so for everyone who's following in your packets, this is on page 30 of your original packet. Um, and just to note, there was a supplemental reference, but it was uh, too lengthy to include. So I will um, identify some things as there may be questions on to as to the specific master plan references, for example. Um, so the multimodal plan um, is one name we've had for it. It's also been coined as the Complete Streets Implementation Plan. Um, many of you may know that we have a Complete Streets policy in Lebanon, but policies often um, are very short and don't necessarily have specific actions assigned to helping to implement them. The um, multimodal transportation plan would do that. And just to make, take a step back, because I get this question a lot, I want to quickly define multimodal. And that refers to the ability of people to move around using modes of transportation other than a personal vehicle. And key factors are infrastructure like sidewalks and bus stops, services like snow removal and land use patterns like density and the distance, as well as connectivity and accessibility between destinations. And that goes hand in hand with complete streets, which are streets designed and operated to enable safe access and mobility for all users, regardless of age and ability, so that pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and transit users are able to safely move along or across city streets. Now, this is not a new need. It's not a new concept to have a plan either. When the City of Lebanon established the Pedestrian and Bicyclist Advisory Committee 25 years ago, um, one of its two or three directives was to create a plan. And to this day, that is an outstanding need. We do not have either a transportation plan or a ped bike plan. And in most communities you'll, you'll go to, they have at least one or the other, and we do not have either. So this multimodal plan is seen as an interim measure or a module for an ultimate transportation plan to get us in gear, literally. Um, there's a lot of urgency around this. We are facing um, life safety issues in Lebanon. There um, are actually fatalities and um, significant crashes, and it's a national as well as statewide trend that we're seeing an increase um, mainly in pedestrian fatalities. There's been a 166% increase, increase in pedestrian fatalities in New Hampshire since 2019 alone. Um, while bike crashes are lower, they're, they're still concerning, and we just had one on Bank Street Extension, for example. So um, I view that as probably the, the main area of, of need for such a plan, the public health and safety, not to add that 
Our safe routes to school program has somewhat stagnated and is due for revitalization and a um, city led plan to enhance those facilities and connectivity at a systemic level, not just a whenever the opportunity arises um, level is important. Um, we also have both long term and short term public health emergencies between diabetes and heart health and the current COVID um, pandemic requiring more facilities for active transportation and um, maybe as a nod to the ability to address climate action without necessarily having a plan for one at this point, um, enhancing pedestrian and bicycle facilities will um, improve our ability to have more people out biking and walking and in turn improve air quality um, that affects asthma, greenhouse gases, and, and other climate and health concerns. So um, of all of your criteria, this public health and safety factor is a big one. Um, other drivers include the simple um, facilities deficiencies that we're facing. We do not have a single continuous east-west route from West Lebanon Village um, or 12A to downtown Lebanon. We also don't have a continuous north-south route between Plainfield, Lebanon, and Hanover, um, including Route 10 um, and 12A, or um, along 120 between Meriden, Lebanon, and Hanover. Um, and then examples of specific gaps along those routes include the Mount Support Road area, Mechanic Street, Miracle Mile. Um, some of the, the projects that you've seen mentioned in this current process and having a plan will help to prioritize which of those um, actually gets funded. So right now, while you're trying to vet a whole slew of projects, and this happens at the state level as well, if we can prioritize and get preliminary concepts and use the most current standards to um, develop concepts for these projects in a plan, we will be shovel ready. And that, that addresses some of the other criteria you're looking at, which includes the ability to attract funding. So CARES Act funding and um, past federal funding really requires you to have a shovel ready plan. You may not have the permitting ready yet, but they want uh, what's known as community preparedness. So that means not just the blueprint and right away for a plan, but also the data supporting the need and having a multimodal plan will gather the public input data to support that need and make us ready to apply for grants. We've had um, a mixed bag of success in recent years applying for TAP um, or transportation alternative program grants and similar ones, for example, and we will have non-tax based funding if we can make ourselves better prepared through a plan like this. In okay. addition, um, for a second, Rebecca, a, sure. Rebecca, I, I, I feel a little bit overwhelmed by this. Um, okay. I, I mean, I think we're being asked to score, prioritize a specific plan, but what you're describing sounds it's just kind of a, like a universal revamping of the city, and I just can't wrap my head around it. Sure. So With, to the specific item that we are being asked to score. So the specific item based on the material in your packet would be a consultant study broken out into two phases over the years 2021 and 2022 um, for a total cost of $45,000. Um, with anticipated technical assistance, um, meaning that it's it's even lower cost than would traditionally be expected from such work. And the scope of work would be to tie together the priorities that we've seen in multiple regional, local, and state plans that say multimodal transportation is important, but they don't say how to do it or where we need it particularly in Lebanon. Only at the local level can we get these um, projects defined and ready to be prioritized in order to then take them to grant application level, for example. And as part of the consultant study, they would be 
doing due diligence to review those other plans so that we could have a single reference as a city, not just for grants, but also development projects. We have continued growth um, in our development, but not necessarily commensurate um, infrastructure investment and ped bike infrastructure. So this, this plan would um, flesh out the project needs to support the um, strong public input that we're seeing across the board for better multimodal infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, Laurel, I think, you know, it, it's become clear through some of the, the development review process that um, we're, we don't have all the information that we need to help the planning board I fill these gaps when the developments come along um, in terms of knowing what kinds of improvements are needed in what corridors or along what roads. Uh, and that's what this plan will help us do. The, the complete streets policy is several years old now, um, and it's been used a little bit, but it could certainly be used much, much more efficiently and effectively if we can flesh out what it is we what kinds of improvements we want to see in different parts of the town so that when either there's a capital project that comes along or a state project or, or a private development project there's an opportunity to go to that plan and say okay we want a sidewalk on that segment of road or we want a bike lane or we need that intersection worked on to, to put all of that into a single plan uh, is going to help us in many many ways i think Right, and we don't have that leverage right now. I, I can think of no better word than um, leverage when it comes to having a plan like this, whether it's when applying for funding or getting connectivity with these development projects. And also in terms of implementing the master plan, it's um, it, it has uh, over 40 actions and strategies indirectly referenced in the master plan, and then seven specific um, references to developing a ped bike or similar plan across seven different chapters in the master plan. So are we ready to, to discuss this? Um, may I just add a couple other things? I did not get to address the economic side of this because I, I believe it might still be perceived as a cost versus a benefit. Can we, um, can we, and those quickly would be that it, there is also non-tax based revenue associated with um, the property values that um, there's evidence that it increases. Um, well, that's tax based, but um, the Stay Work Play New Hampshire initiative has identified that outdoor recreation is one of the top three attractors for um, younger generations to not only stay, but to live in um, New Hampshire. And we have an aging population. We need to um, ensure that Lebanon is positioned for economic vitality with a worker base and um, the high quality jobs that go with it. And the more we can support active transportation, but also the outdoor recreation aspect, the better we'll be positioned um, as an economy. So that I just wanted to throw that in there as well. Okay, are, are we, uh, thank you. Are we ready to score this one? Yes. Again, I think um, since I can't give this one a three, I'll give this one a two also in terms of division or department priority. Uh, addresses an emergency or public safety need. Again, this <clears throat> this is one of those that I'm kind of torn on because the study itself doesn't, but the end result is or does. And that is, you know, if it's implemented, uh, it will provide for safe bicycling. It'll provide better pedestrian walking and access to, um, you know, safety to, uh, and avoiding car accidents. So... So the study itself doesn't, but the end result, I think, can. So I don't know how you want to score that. How about a two? To what? How about a two? All right. Two out of 15 or, or 
Oh, sorry. How about a um, 10? All right. I'm good with that. Corrects a known or anticipated deficiency. We're not sure. We I, think it, I think it identifies them. Yeah, but it doesn't correct them. Not in and of itself, no. So like would, the, you, would you say that it positions us to get funding that would correct it? Yes, but that's not what the question is asking. Okay. Yeah, so again, the, the facility assessment plan, which is, uh, we scored that as a two in terms of Correcting known or anticipated deficiencies. Or a two. Yeah, or maybe yeah a two. I, I think a two also. I agree. Provides capacity for future growth. Again, two. Two. Okay. Uh, results in long term cost savings. No. No. Uh, supports job development and increased tax base. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, the implementation of it might, but right. not the plan. Right. So maybe a, a one or a two? A one. Furthers the master plan, definitely a three. Yeah. Uh, leverages non property tax revenues, potentially. Not, I mean, not in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, and the matching funds available. Not well, actually, there are matching funds because we would be working with through the Regional Planning Commission, and they would use uh, their UPWP funds to help offset costs so that we get a bigger product for the cost. Okay, two. So, two on the matching funds. Uh, was it a zero on the non property tax? And then the last project is the Miracle Mile Pedestrian and Transit Improvements. Uh, this one is similar in a sense to the climate, uh, climate Action Plan. So the, we've, uh, we've more or less broken the Miracle Mile from the, new, uh, from the Terry Dudley Bridge to Poverty Lane Intersection into three sections. The first segment between the driveways uh, of the Listen Center and two of the, the opposing driveways of Miracle Mile Plaza. We've designed and bid that project. That is going to start later this month and should be done this fall. That will include sidewalk segments on both sides of the road, a um, new street lights, a, a new crosswalk with flashing beacon lights for safety and a refuge island in the middle of the road uh, for folks who need to, to have a safe place to stand in the middle of the road if they, if they can't cross both lanes at once. So that project is funded from prior year's appropriations. Uh, we believe we have enough funds uh, from those two prior year appropriations to design and, and possibly construct the segment that would go from the Miracle Mile Plaza the rest of the way to the Dudley Bridge to the west. Uh, the, the proposal for this year uh, was to put 250000 in to give us the remaining funds to design and, and construct the, the segment that would go east uh, from, from, the, from the middle section to Poverty Lane inter intersection. Uh, as part of so this miracle model segment is part of a larger effort and it's related in some sense to the to the last discussion item um, where sean and i had talked about wanting to make regular investments in the pedestrian network within the community and fill these gaps so that we have uh complete networks between our two downtowns uh, and other other areas that are destinations. Uh, but again, this is this is a project. This is one of those needed projects for which we don't have enough money. Um, and, and there's and so it's been placed, pushed out into the into the parking lot uh, until we can find enough money. 
So this, this along with, with several others, uh, are out there in the future until we can find the money for them. Any questions on this one? No. So I put this as a, uh, I think it's important. Again, I continue to think that the building that network connectivity is important. Um, but if I can't have it as a two, then it, it defaults to a priority one for the, for the department. Um, in terms of addressing emergency or public safety needs, what's the committee's feeling? I give it a, a five. I would agree with that. I I would be okay with that. It, it, simply because it, you know, it's sitting out <clears throat> somewhat in the future. So boy, if you've ever tried to cross that road. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. that piece, right? I would I would advocate a higher score if it was if it was that piece right there at Nissan. But that piece is covered and, and is due to be constructed anytime now. Uh, so this this is just connecting again, building out the network so that we ultimately get a, a complete sidewalk network between West Lebanon and downtown Lebanon. Which we can't pay for right now. Yeah, I mean lots of lots of important things don't fit within 20.7 million over six years. Yeah. Um, so five for that? Yeah. Okay. Corrects a known or anticipated deficiency? Give it a two. Not a three. <laughs> that was my yeah, day. I, the, the lack of a the lack of a complete network is, is certainly part of part of a deficiency. It's known. It's a known deficiency. I would give it a we've got people walking the roadway, we've got people yeah. trying to get around it. it, it there's no question about it. It's, it's a deficiency. We have pedestrians that are walking the travel way, so they have no other option. In the wintertime, it's even worse with those snow banks approaching to the roadway. There's no place to go, there's no haven for people. It's it's a clear problem. It's frustrating that we don't have the money to do what David and I are talking about. It's stringing the whole city together with one long network to allow people to get from one side to the other safely. And unfortunately, I just don't have the money to do it. Yeah, I, I think it's a three, definitely. I do too. Okay, provides capacity for future growth. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, results in long term cost savings. Less clear. Yeah, maybe a one or two. Yeah, two maybe. Sports job development tax base increase. Yeah. Yep. Furthers the master plan. Definitely. Yeah. Leverages non property tax revenues. No. No. And matching funds. Uh, again, this. There's possibilities for future TAP grants uh, applications. Those are those have been coming out every two years. There would be an application uh, cycle this year, but it, I'm not aware that it's been announced yet. So, uh, but there are potential for for matching funds uh, in the future. So maybe a one. Okay. Um, that. So then the last, that's the last of the planning projects. The last item to share with you tonight is the school district's spreadsheet. These are very small, very small numbers, but it was requested last meeting. Again, the school district has a much lower threshold uh, for what constitutes a capital project, it's roughly $10,000 as opposed to our $50,000 uh, for, for actual construction projects. Uh, you can see from this spreadsheet that they've got things posted. In some cases, it's capital reserve funds that they have already set aside, or it's operating budget, or they use their unexpended fund balance at the end of each year. They 
that try to take on one or more of these projects. So some things listed as EOY is end of year. Um, obviously, the big, the, the single big number that represents about 85 or 90 percent of this whole spreadsheet is the is the large renovation project, the, the multi-facility renovation project that has been before the the voters on a couple of occasions, I think, and has not yet passed. I don't know the school board's plans at this point um, as to what they'll be bringing forward or what or when they'll be bringing that forward again uh, in what format. So, but that's the big number. It would have to go through um, the voters because of the, because of the body aspect of that project, uh, they need authorization from the from the voters. Any other? No, well, thank you for getting that. That's useful information. Yeah, it's again. They, I want to. I want to give the school district credit. Um, Dana, Dana Airy did a lot. He, did, he gave me a lot more information this year than they've given me in the past. Uh, but again, the CIP committee, the city, doesn't really have any say over what they do, uh, except at the ballot box. So. Um, that is the last, that's really the last of the items that are on the CIP committee's agenda for tonight. I will complete and compile these scores uh, from all of the projects that we did review, uh, and I'll make that available with the minutes of these two meetings, and then the, the full planning board can talk about these. I don't think we're gonna have time on the 24th next Monday. So it probably to be the September 14th or the September 28th meeting. Um, hopefully the 14th, because I need to then turn around and get it to the administration to get packaged up with the rest of, of the budget for, for the council. Uh, any final thoughts, Laurel or Tom? Just thank you to everyone for putting all of this together and, and being so patient in explaining to those of us who have little understanding of these matters. Yeah, I thought this was this was a good process. And Bruce, I appreciate you kind of uh, hoodwinking me into being on the committee. <laughs> I'll bear another committee for you, Tom. <laughs> Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? So I would like, yes, a second. And a little second, no doubt. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Order turn. Roll call, roll call. Oh, wait a second. Mr. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry? It's a roll call vote. Yes. Okay. Oh, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Laurel? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I vote in favor of you. All right. Thank you so much. We're adjourned. Thank right. you. Thank you all. Let's <laughs> go.